Oh my god. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Artifact number 26. We're going to be discussing uh, Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf and a little bit dipping into uh, Siddhartha, right? Uh, books that are uh, similar enough and yet different enough that's going to make for an interesting kind of uh, discussion. Um, if you are listening uh, to this on YouTube, you could also do this through audio podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from. We are Artifact Books, Art, and Culture. Um, so, yeah, just, just to sort of jump into uh, uh, Herman Hesse's life. Uh, so the only thing that I do know is what I read from Wikipedia a couple of days ago. Okay. Right. So uh, he, he, he did come from what is called, you know, like an established family. Right. He was educated. His family was educated. Uh, there was this kind of um, interesting thing going on in, in the late 19th century, mid, uh, mid 19th century. Nietzsche was part of this and, and other educated uh, Germans were part of this. Uh, where, you know, they and their families, they would be very interested in, you know, like Indian languages, right? They, they would be, you know, that's when uh, Sanskrit first started coming into vogue. So his family uh, was also like, I think his father specifically was a philologist of some sort. He had other relatives that were doing something similar. Um, and very early on, he decided that he uh, wanted to be a writer. And, uh, you know, like, like it, it seems like his life was uh, tumultuous internally, even if externally it wasn't so much until maybe, you know, World uh, War I started and the Nazis came to power, right? I, I guess there's uh, some tumult there, but uh, his sort of uh, tumult was, was very internal, mm -hmm. right? Uh, very much becoming of an artist. Um, he probably had some level of fascination with that aspect of himself because his best known books are all about this sort of journey into the self, understanding the self, trying to reconcile various uh, contradictions that that you might have. Um, so, and and with Steppenwolf specifically, uh, we have an educated type, right? We have a professor that has hit middle age. I believe he's forty seven when the book begins. So, uh, as a forty seven year old um, uh, dealing with uh, kind of like european history where they were at that time this this does takes take place uh, uh after uh world war one or maybe right during it right uh, i'm not exactly sure right but he has the, the the protagonist uh and narrator harry haller has a bunch of uh conflicts related to this right mm -hmm. and and you know Hess himself right on some level this you know he is a little bit i think haller is a little bit of a mouthpiece for Hess because Hess was very skeptical of nationalism, right? He was very skeptical yeah. of any kind of uh, jingoism. It did not matter whether this was under the auspices of, um, you know, the uh, the, the, the post-Versailles uh, government. Uh, and it didn't matter whether it was, uh, you know, under the auspices of, of Nazi Germany. He, you know, never liked any of this, right? He was always mm -hmm. uh, kind of like in principled fashion, uh, anti-war, anti-nationalism. And, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of similar to, I guess, what you would expect from liberal types, uh, of that time period. I, I, you know, like when I think of other, others that were sort of either German or German, uh, adjacent, uh, people like a uh, Stefan, uh, Zweig, uh, they, they were very much in this kind of mentality of, uh, we need a cosmopolitan sort of, worldview right we need um mm -hmm. but but uh, at the same time it's interesting because uh since they did come from different kinds of, of privilege despite everything that they witnessed they never really came up with very good ideas for uh displacing the problems that they saw in the world right i believe at some point herman hess uh when he was like sort of you know trying to you know educate people on, on his various points of view uh he was complaining that you know, uh, it, it, it was a failure to try to introduce love into politics, which, you know, it's so oddly, you know, it is very oddly naive for someone so educated, but, you know, maybe not, right? Or maybe that's exactly what the issue is, right? If you do come from this bourgeois world, um, that will sort of keep you from understanding the genesis of so many problems. And you see this kind of conflict in Steppenwolf uh, between uh, the bourgeois world and, and, and the Steppenwolf himself, right? Uh, Harry Haller. Mm -hmm. 
um, and, and exactly what that entails. And I, I'm sure this this had something to do with uh, Hess's own sensibilities and experiences and his own kind of disillusionments, right? So mm -hmm. by way of introduction, I guess that's kind of like all I've got. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's great. That's more than I uh, than I knew necessarily about him. Um, and I think that we can maybe just before we start in on the book itself, uh, give him kudos for being such a dense, rich, poetic, philosophical writer. Um, you know, he's got these novels that it, rather than going for massive length and and just packing everything in, he's very good at um, trusting the reader giving you enough uh enough brush strokes enough sketch work on the the characters especially and the scenarios uh that they're in and, and the general milieu to then let you begin to work on these novels yourself um and so uh, I, I mean the the modern writer that he uh, brings to mind for me the most is probably Charles Johnson who we've covered yes, earlier yes. on the show yeah, there's definitely an Oxford and tail connection that we're going to get to Right. Uh, and even even aspects of Middle Passage or, or some of Johnson's other work, um, they, they both are Western writers, obviously Johnson and African-American here in the States and in more recent times um, with with all of his own sensibilities that come from that. But um, both of them incorporating plenty of Eastern thought and, and themes and philosophy in as well uh and this this really nice dense melding of the eastern and western um and letting all that work within and upon wonderful characters uh right they're they're so good at drawing up uh the, these characters and so um i think that maybe the final thing to say about the the book itself before we start in with specifics is just that um in the intro to this you know the author's note uh, it's kind of just interesting that that Hesse takes the time to write this note talking about how misinterpreted he felt this book had been. Uh, I think he, mm -hmm. the quote is something along the lines of among all my works, I think is the most misinterpreted. And he does, um, he talks about that in the context of it being sort of his somewhat autobiographical midlife novel and concentrating on a figure in midlife. And yet a lot of younger people had latched on to this book and probably my, my guess would be especially the, um, you know, maybe the more hedonistic uh, on the surface, the hedonistic uh, aspects of it, the, the, the masked ball, the, the magic theater, the assumption that there's a drug uh, in, induced, you know, um, set of visions that he has or whatever that we'll talk about later. Uh, I, you know, I could see how that would kind of worm its way into the counterculture a bit and, and people would latch onto this and be like, oh, you know, sweet, man, this guy who was, you know, living this bourgeois life and then it trips out and, you know, whatever uh, kind of things you could say. But also the the morose nature of, of Holler and the Steppenwolf and how, you know, people sort of, uh, I guess, seem to latch on to his, his angst and his frustration with, um, with his own self and, and his place in this bourgeois world. Um, and again, you know, Hess is adamant in his note that this is for him uh, a book about believing, not a book about giving up. Um, and I, I think my argument, and we'll get to the specific passages here shortly, would even be that he does a good job with humor and injecting some humor in places you might not expect um, to to put these things in contrast to one another. So um, I just I always think it's interesting because we don't always get a lot of commentary from authors about, uh, especially if they feel like, no, 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 you know, that the critics and, and the public are getting this wrong. You know, they're misunderstanding me. Um, I think it's maybe just important to point out that he at least thought enough of that to uh, to have to write a little piece on it. So um, anyway, yeah, that would be all my manner of introduction. Yeah, the yeah, the, the fact that. Um both Charles Johnson uh, as well as uh, Hess are sort of invoking Eastern philosophy. Uh, I feel like Eastern philosophy, if you're going to put into a book, would maybe not in every case, but would oftentimes necessitate very rich characters and characterization, right? Because, um, you know, in a novel, you don't want to simply... Uh, give like a bunch of philosophical posits disconnected from people. But mm -hmm. if the philosoph if the philosophical posit 
um, is one of, you know, like a journey of like self-discovery, uh, of, of going through these various changes and, and, and learning how to synthesize all your kind of, you know, covariant, uh, experiences, um, you're going to have to do something with rich characterization, right? You can't just ignore the character, right? Cause yep. then it, 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 you know, it, in a weird way, like if you're trying to sort of say that there is something worthwhile within Eastern philosophy or any kind of philosophy for that matter, and yet the, uh, sort of vehicle for this is not sufficiently sketched, then it seems as if like the posits of that philosophy are not as rich or as interesting or, or as relevant as you think, right? So mm -hmm. you would have to really sort of uh, take pains to ensure that um, uh, there is like sufficient characterization. There are enough like twists and turns because also like you don't want to just flatten someone into, you know, some kind of like a, uh, a stereotyped or maybe even like an archetype of like a, a hero's journey of some sort, right? Uh, instead of flattening it, you want to bring out the individual details and contradictions. I mean, Siddhartha from Siddhartha is is quite different in many respects as a person from uh, Harry Holler. Mm -hmm. And they, they have their own little tendencies, right? They have their own little, you know, uh, games that they play with themselves. They have their own issues to sort through. But those like like understanding how those individual issues get sorted right th th this kind of you know br uh, lends credence to those original philosophies so that's just like one observation i made while while reading it and um uh, another part like so you mentioned uh, how hess like early uh on like when when he has his uh, uh introduction to the book right he offers a, a preface because he feels like it, it's been misinterpreted in many ways um, and what he isolates specifically is this idea that uh, readers would latch on to not just the hedonism, but also the idea that there's this kind of hopelessness. And although I don't necessarily find the ending of the book uh, hopeless, there are some interesting things that happen. And maybe this could be like a good segue into uh, the the introduction, right, to the, to the uh, uh, inner book, right? So the inner book is the Steppenwolf text as a manuscript left behind by Harry uh, uh, Haller with uh, the nephew of his landlady. Yep. And uh, this nephew, he, you know, he got to know uh, this uh, Steppenwolf and he read this manuscript and he's able to uh, contrast or sometimes compare his uh, uh, sort of knowledge of uh, of Harry Holler to what's what's in the text itself. So he offers this introduction himself. It's about twenty pages, so it's roughly ten percent. This introduction it, it's substantive enough, right? It's ten percent uh, of the entire text, or so, maybe a little bit less. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like in in this introduction, there, there's some stuff that I think is is worth mentioning. So although, for instance, uh, Hess is annoyed perhaps by some of the ways that the book has been taken, I think there's like enough, you know, details in the introduction where you could, if you would like, right, you don't necessarily have to come to this conclusion, but you can come to either a pessimistic view of the philosophy that is being presented or uh, you could come, you know, maybe uh, to an ambivalent view, right? In terms of like, if you want to, um, you know, like not be so optimistic in terms of like what, 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 you know, like what, what Hess exactly is driving at. And that's because like, you know, the, the, the nephew ends up saying things like, you know, um, uh, after, you know, reading this manuscript and after getting to know this guy, I can still imagine him now sort of walking up and down the streets walking um maybe i should read this directly like walking uh, up and down various houses yeah and uh you know saying so like let's let's let, let's get to this specifically okay um where is this so uh on page 20 no i am sure he has not taken his life he is still alive and somewhere warily goes up and down the stairs of strange houses, stares somewhere at clean scoured parquet floors and carefully tended um, arucarias. I don't know how to pronounce that. Sits for days in libraries and nights in taverns or lying on a hired sofa, listens to the world beneath his window and the hum of human life from which he knows that he is excluded. 
but he has not killed himself for a glimmer of belief still tells him that he is to drink this frightful suffering in his heart to the dregs and that it is of this suffering he must die. I think of him often. So it seems by the end of the book that he comes to a, a recognition, right? Perhaps like, you know, maybe not a transcendence, but the beginning of some transcendence. And yet uh, this guy is saying, you know, maybe this perception is correct. Maybe it's not, but his perception of the Steppenwolf in combination with this manuscript is that he is still somewhat trapped in the life that mm. Pauler is describing and is trying to transcend throughout the manuscript itself. Right. So, you know, it, I, I can understand uh, how uh, Hess is annoyed by some of the you know positive or perhaps more ambivalent stuff isn't really latched onto as much as the negativity, but he does open plenty of avenues to have like a somewhat, you know, at best let's call it ambivalent view of what happens to uh, Harry Holler or, and, and others like him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, it, of course, one of the easy things to point out is just this preface serving as a bit of a juxtaposition between the nephew who is the epitome of, of bourgeois values and, and life and, and takes pride in that. Right. Mm -hmm. So he speaks, um, you know, shortly after that section you just read, which I highlighted as well, you know, just nice writing and definitely gets to the core of, um, you know, some of the nephew's beliefs about the Steppenwolf. But he says right after that, he has not made life lighter for me. He had not the gift of fostering strength and joy in me. Oh, on the contrary, but I am not he, and I live my own life, a narrow middle-class life, but a solid one filled with duties. And so we can think of him peacefully and affectionately, my aunt and I. She would have, had, she would have more to say of him than I have, but that lies buried in her good heart. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a nice uh, setup to, to kind of this intro from somebody who, um, in, in numerous different passages in the novel, we can assume that Holler probably had some contempt for, some level of contempt. Yet there are also parts um, where he does engage with him. You know, he asks his opinion or asks if he wants to come up to his room, uh, I think, at one point to read a philosopher and, and get his thoughts on it because Steppenwolf understands that um, the nephew is a learned man and, and had some experience with languages and this kind of thing, but, I, but he turns him down, right? Uh, he doesn't, he's like too afraid to go up there and see the artistic Mm -hmm. uh like squalor uh that that, ho that he thinks holler is living in um and doesn't want to see his alcohol bottles around and this kind of thing it's like too mm -hmm. much for him even to look upon um which is an interesting comment on him as a character himself but um yeah i think that's you know it's, it's all a good setup there's one other passage from the the preface that um i wanted to read through quick just because again i, I think it's good just another example of solid writing from uh from Hesse, but it's uh it's it's an interesting like again in to the the nephew's perception of him so this is from page nine where he's talking about um holler attending a lecture it was a look that did not simply criticize the lecturer this is a look that holler gave uh, to that lecture annihilating the famous man with its delicate but crushing irony that was the least of it it was more sad than ironical. It was indeed utterly and hopelessly sad. It conveyed a quiet despair, born partly of conviction, partly of a mode of thought which had become habitual with him. This despair of his not only unmasked the conceited lecturer and dismissed with its irony the matter at hand, the expectant attitude of the public, the somewhat presumptuous title under which the lecture was announced. No, the Steppenwolf's look pierced our whole epoch its whole overwrought activity, the whole surge and strife, the whole vanity, the whole superficial play of a shallow, opinionated intellectuality. And alas, the look went still deeper, went far below the faults, defects, and hopelessness of our time, our intellect, our culture alone. It went right to the heart of all humanity. It bespoke eloquently in a single second the whole despair of a thinker, of one who knew the full worth and meaning of man's life. It said, see what monkeys we are? look such as man and at once all renown all intelligence all the attainments of the spirit all progress towards the sublime the great and the enduring in man fell away and became a monkey's trick so i i found that passage interesting too just because it you know it sets up holler as this this piercing intellectual someone who can see through things and there is a bit of then a precedent set for a scene like later in the book where he meets up with an old professor 
and goes to his house and is repulsed. And uh, we'll probably talk about that scene a bit, but, um, you know, certainly his, his disdain for the general, uh, you know, intelligentsia and, and the academic world. And, um, I think that it's maybe good in that sense to like give him credit as a character because he's, he is someone who's portrayed as a, a thinker and, um, not an artist, but just someone who who does read and try to learn about the world and his own place in the world. And he can see through certain BS out there. And yet also he's having all this internal strife. So none of that is particularly satisfying, right? He's still mm-hmm. trying to get to the core of his own personhood and um and and, and his place in the world. So um yeah, I think that preface is a good setup. I know I asked you in my show notes, you know what, why is there why is this there and do we think it works? So I don't know if you have any final comments on that before we get into uh, the Harry Holler's records section. Yeah. In my notes to you, I I mentioned how, um, you know, one of the reasons why this uh, introduction works is because it allows a a kind of like, you know, secondary objective point of view on Harry Holler and all these experiences and all this stuff, uh, right. Like unfiltered, uh, through the eyes of someone that is in some ways, um, you know, like perhaps Harry Hall in some ways is an unreliable narrator. It's hard to exactly say to what degree, but I think to some degree that that is true, right? Mm-hmm. Even, I mean, to the extent that we have all this kind of, uh, you know, s- uh, like semi uh, magical events that occur, right? This is clearly a kind of stand in for what's going on mentally, right? So yeah. even on that superficial level, right, there is like some level of unreliability, uh, but, you know, I, I, you know, like just think about it now, uh, maybe I wouldn't necessarily use the, the the word objective, right? It's not so much that it's an objective look into uh, Harry Holler. It's more so that it's a secondary look, right, from mm-hmm. someone that is not as uh, invested in, you know, uh, Holler's uh, assumptions about life, someone who, you know, has uh, other things that he uh, uh, believes, um, someone that is only sort of you know, uh, glimpsed uh, him briefly, but, you know, w- with enough time, I guess, to sort of understand like what what exactly uh, is in the manuscript versus the way that he, you know, the Steppenwolf was sort of day to day. So uh, th- th- that, do- like, if we have a text that is all kind of like almost fully from the mind of someone that is uh, at least in some level unreliable, it is useful right to have this other piece to it partly because like if it is a book that tries to be philosophical if it's a book that has you know actual ideas right that it wishes to import right ideas of depth um this does kind of like cement them a a little bit further um and it all you know it's also an opportunity to to have other kinds of uh philosophy that's brought about so like um i and that's the thing like i uh, i have uh, it's so dog-eared, right? And, um, yeah. you know, like at some point, it's like sometimes like literally every page gets dog-eared. And I, I for, yeah. and I forgot about this one piece in the introduction that since we're on it now, uh, we're going to be talking about it. So this is like right after uh, the passage that you finished reading. Um, this, is, this is what the narrator says. A, rem- a remark of Holler, Hollers gave me the key to this interpretation. He said to me once when we were talking of the so-called horrors of the Middle Ages, quote, these horrors were really non-existent. A man of the Middle Ages would detest the whole mode of our present day life as something far more than horrible, far more than barbarous. Every age, every culture, every custom and tradition has its own character, its own weakness and its own strength, its beauties and ugliness accepts certain sufferings as matters of course, puts up patiently with certain evils. Human life is reduced to real suffering, to hell, only when two ages, two cultures and religions overlap. A man of the classical age who had to live in medieval times would suffocate miserably, just as a savage does in the midst of our civilization. Now there are times when a whole generation is caught in this way between two ages, two modes of life when the consequence that it loses all power to understand itself and has no standard, no security, no simple acquiescence. Naturally, everyone does not feel this equally strongly. A nature such as Nietzsche's had to suffer our present ills more more than a generation in advance. What he had to go through alone and misunderstood, thousands 
suffer today, right? I mean, even that as a piece of philosophy, like it's very interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, what one reason I think is, you know, it's it's very much applicable to different situations. It is an interesting thought to to think about. Uh, you can mm -hmm. perhaps think of individuals to whom this might apply if you, you know, really kind of like set your mind to it. Um, I, I think in some ways it, it's sort of a, a, you know, it might apply, you know, even to like me, like or to Dan, right? Like it, I feel like in many ways, like if you're an artist living today, and you are really kind of, you know, sort of uh, fixated on craft, you're fixated on uh, having something of substance to do and to say with what you're doing, as opposed to like necessarily becoming famous or any of that. Like if, if you're motivated by many of the things that are not, you know, part of the incentive structure, you know, in, in the world today, um, you will feel kind of like you might belong to, to a different age. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, I wonder, you know, and this applies to like other other ideas in the book, right? And, and like you you could disagree with some of these statements because uh, it's not it's not so easy to to test, right? I feel like this in many respects, like so many people at any age, they want to claim that for. I mean, I just claimed it for myself, right? A lot yeah. of people want to claim that for them for themselves because it's you know on some level it's a little bit. It, I don't want to call it pretentious, but there is some pretense to it. Right. Uh, there is yeah. this kind of like highfalutin quality to it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure it has to like going through World War One and then seeing the rise of Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, he probably felt this even more deeply after the book was published, after he saw, you know, everything that happened post Versailles. Uh, and but everybody wants to sort of claim that for themselves. Right. I, I feel like many people today would, would think the same exact thing. And, you know, perhaps the stakes are a little bit different. Right. We don't necessarily have. You know, even if like, you know, you pay attention to, to, to the headlines, it doesn't feel that way. I do think that, you know, the um, chances of a, of a wider kind of like world war are probably lower than they were, you know, a century ago. Um, I, I think all that is true, but uh, in different ways, you know, no matter what the stakes are, everybody wants to lay claim to this kind of a, a idea, right? How applicable it is. And um, perhaps it's not as applicable as Hess believes or as the text makes it seem, but um, it, it is interesting enough that you could work with it. You could play with it. You could find applications. You could turn away from applications. And I mean, this is kind of the hallmark of, of great writing. Not only is it just sort of craft first, but the idea is you don't have to necessarily agree or disagree with them. That's kind of irrelevant, right? That's always beside the point. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I dog-eared that page as well. And I I think I, I don't really have a whole lot to add to what you just said about it. Um, you know, it definitely stands out. There's this there's this tendency for almost anybody who would be of the mind to even want to seek out and read this book to already be in a place where they can read something like that and think, yeah, me, you know, definitely yeah. that applies to me. Um, right. I'm someone who sees beyond the, mm -hmm. the current zeitgeist. I, I feel trapped, uh, you know, all these things. Um, but for some people it will be true. And, um, you know, it could be true at, at any given point in history. I mean, even Jessica's recent, essay uh, on the auto machination website where she talks about Vivian Meyer and Herman Melville as you know, people who just prioritized art and craft um, rather than obviously fame and notoriety in their time uh, comes to mind a little bit. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the setup with this preface, then we can go into the, the next section um, that I didn't put in my notes to you, but it occurs to me now is that in a way with everything that happens in this main body of the book, which are, are Harry's records discovered by the nephew, you could make the argument that it sets it up as some achievement on Holler's part as an artwork, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, I think these themes are definitely present in this book. They're present um, in Siddhartha as well. The act of creation, this, this artistic drive, um, this importance of turning a capable intellect into something more than just that and questioning it of its own value unto itself. Um, you know, if this is something that, that the Steppenwolf was trying to do over time is figure out, you know, how, how do I actually make myself uh, useful, how to create anything out of my life? Well, um, certainly, you know, if you take this whole section as like a diary entry of things that really happened in his life, you almost have to dismiss a fair amount of it 
um, you, you know, like, like you said, as he'd be an unreliable narrator. It would just seem like kind of daydreaming uh, sometimes in flights of fancy, especially you know, certain parts like as an old man with these young women deciding that they want to, you know, teach him and love him and take him, you know, these are kind of typical fantasies maybe, but um, if, if you interpret it that way as this is the nephew happening upon this novella or this artwork maybe that, that Holler wrote uh, and just decided to inject it, you know, himself into it, a lot of autobiography, um, that also could be, a, you know, something to, to analyze and to think on. So. Yeah, it, it, it makes me wonder, especially with the kind of, um, you know, first of all, like, it, is the nephew's perception accurate in terms of uh, Holler would continue, you know, you know, to walk up and down the streets with the same thoughts and the same problems without having essentially resolved or synthesized anything. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, assuming that it is a correct uh, perception, right, that aligns the reality, uh you know, like, it, 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 can we then view this uh, text that the Steppenwolf produces as this kind of like, you know, moment, right? That this this thing that he thinks he has resolved, he only re resolves temporarily in the sense that he's able to bring this manuscript out into the world, which is uh, uh, distinct from his prior sort of like books that he's written. Maybe you know these books. It seems like they were on these like minor subjects like in the same way that like you know Hess is like family full of philologists or whatever it's like you know that it's valuable work right but it is kind of you know apparatchik sort of type stuff right where you know if it wasn't his his father that would have done some of those contributions it would have been literally anybody else right simply because okay we've now discovered sanskrit we now discovered uh you know these these other uh sub languages um, we need to like translate it. We need to figure out what these texts are about. We need to do X, Y, and Z. Somebody would have figured that out, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe he sort of views uh, himself in that same category. And yet with this one text, he's able to do something that's different. He's able to do something that only he could contribute to the world in just this precise kind of way, right? And maybe afterwards he does essentially flare out, right? That was his one contribution. And now it's sort of time to return, you know, deep into himself again, um, you know, dealing with the same uh, problems, right? So th that's definitely a way that you could view it, right? And again, you know, Hess could be legitimately annoyed with some of these readings, but he definitely opens up those avenues uh, for those readings. I don't think there's anything wrong with being at least somewhat pessimistic or ambivalent about, you know, because like you, you want to imagine, you know, the Steppenwolf like making great art after book, after book, after book, after book, after this, right? <laughs> but, but maybe, yeah. you know, maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe, maybe this was it. Right. So, yeah. Um, Do you want to kick off the uh, the section now, Harry Holler's records from Mad Men Only? Because you, in your notes to me, you talked about just these opening lines, yeah, and wanting to break them down. So, so, so I, I was, um, uh, so I, it's interesting because like I, I, uh, I, when I was just reading uh, some of the kind of preparatory stuff about this book and also about uh, Herman Hess. Um, I was like, all right, let me see what other people are saying. And it turns out that uh, uh, Jack uh, Kerouac, um, uh -huh. he, you know, he had like plenty of like negative things to say about this book, right? Which, which always strikes me as a kind of like, um, you know, like I, I don't always like to make this kind of argument because it, it is to some, it is in some respects ad hominem, but it's the kind of ad hominem that Nietzsche would use, right? In the sense that, all right you've never produced a single fucking book of value and you mm -hmm. want to like shit on a great book like this. Right. Isn't that kind of like, it's just so it always like rubs me the wrong way. Right. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, like, like doing that kind of research also uh, uh, left me with like some, I guess you could call them like modern critiques of the book. Like I found this thing on, uh, I found this thing on Reddit. Right. Um, there's, I don't think there's a point in doing any kind of sc screen share here, but Basically, I was like, all right, let me see what, like, what, what the uh, people on the uh, internet are, are up to in this kind of more, uh, you know, uh, normy sort of environment. So this is on the Canonade subreddit, and uh, the post is called From Mad Men Only, Steppenwolf's Opening Paragraph. And this guy is basically critical uh, of the opening, right? Um, so uh, he says of the paragraph, we're going to read the paragraph after, after his uh, analysis. He starts off by giving you 12 or 13 sentences, many of which are well-crafted, but none of which are particularly inspiring. He tells you about his breathing exercises and his junk mail and his bath, 
because he knows the best way to communicate his feeling of unbearable contentment is to first make you read a bunch of insipid, forgettable things. Things get going finally at rather it had been just one of those days. All the sentences before this point are simple in content structure containing only one or two thoughts each. This one thought is long and complex and it comprises the remainder of the passage as if to say, look, one colorful sentence is worth 13 long ones. It is the antithesis of all the writing before it. Across the board, I think Hess does a nice job of getting his narrative state of mind across to the reader, quality prose, three and a half stars. You know, it's almost yeah. like it, it reads a little bit like, um, you know, like, uh, 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 what is it? A, a pose law, right? Where uh, at a certain point on the internet, you can't tell the difference whether someone is, you know, just being sort of facetious and satirical on the internet versus mm -hmm. actually serious, right? And this this has like, you know, it's parody <laughs> down to the three and a half stars thing. The you know? three and a half, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, someone else like quotes uh, Jack Kerouac, uh, which uh, uh, his, his paragraph on it, and I was, I was reading like, the chapter uh, from the Kerouac uh, book where this is from. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, uh, if he wants to call this forgettable, like that, that, that chapter is, is far more forgettable. Uh, right. and, and it's, and it's this, uh, long nights, simply thinking about the usefulness of that little wire scour, those little yellow copper things you buy in supermarkets for 10 cents, all to me, infinitely more interesting than the stupid and senseless Steppenwolf novel in the shack, which I read with a shrug, this old fart reflecting the conformity of today. And all the while he thought he was a big Nietzsche, old imitator of Dostoevsky, 50 years too late. He feels tormented in a personal hell. He calls it because he doesn't like what other people like. Better at noon to watch the orange and black Princeton colors on the wings of a butterfly. Best to go hear the sound of the sea at night on the shore. And I mean, what strikes me about this is, you know, the guy, you know, the Redditor is just basically, um, you know, he's just kind of like, you know, giving his uh, opinion three and a half stars. But, you know, this comes from also an artist who is a, you know, he's going to be a competitor of uh, Hess, right? And yeah. um, there's nothing memorable, you know, about this writing specifically, right? Even in the sense of sentence basis. Um, and anyway, uh, uh, I, I, I think it would be useful to like actually go through the paragraph itself and to like, you know, compare what, I, you know, I, and I think that would reflect, you know, a kind of typical perspective you might find. Like if you give a random person this book, they might very well come away with what Jack Kerouac says, with what the, the writer writes, right? Um, and and um, it, it's useful to compare that with what's actually happening on the page. So this is a uh, first page of, of the inner text uh, the ma for Madman only. And this is what that paragraph actually is. The day had gone by just as days go by. I had killed it in accordance with my primitive and retiring way of life. I had worked for an hour or two and perused the pages of old books. I had had pains for two hours as elderly people do. I had taken a powder and been very glad when the pains consented to disappear. I had lain in a hot bath and absorbed its kindly warmth. Three times the mail had come with undesired letters and circulars to look through. I had done my breathing exercises, but found it convenient today to omit the thought exercises. I had been for an hour's walk and seen the loveliest feathery cloud patterns penciled against the sky. That was very delightful. So was the reading of the old books. So was the lying in the warm bath. But taken all in all, it had not been exactly a day of rapture. No, it had not even been a day brightened with happiness and joy. Rather, it had been just one of those days which for a long while now had fallen to my lot. The moderately pleasant, the wholly bearable and tolerable, lukewarm days of a discontented middle-aged man. Days without special pains, without special cares, without particular worry, without despair. Days when I calmly wonder, objective and fearless, whether it isn't time to follow the example of Adelbert Stifter and have an accident while shaving. All right. So he, he, uh, uh cut his neck. Uh, he was a, he was a German, uh, a writer of like, I think it was like kind of a like descriptive sort of scenes, right. Maybe travel writing from what I recall, maybe some philosophy and he, uh, killed himself, um, uh, by slitting, uh, his, his own throat. Uh, yeah. but I mean, th th this paragraph strikes me as just like, so the critique being like you have only one good sense for 13 boring ones. Uh, 
these are all very well done sentences, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, and, and it kind of, it, it's, it's, it's sort of telling that some of these other individual sentences were not isolated for discussion. So for example, um, I had taken a powder and been very glad when the pains consented to disappear, right? Mm -hmm. um, like this, this, this phrase, like consented to disappear as if like you're constantly in, the, in this struggle of like, you know, almost convincing your pains, like, why are we here? Why are you doing this? Right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I sort of, you know, um, uh, I know exactly what he's talking about. Like I've had, you know, chronic pains, uh, you know, all throughout my body ever since I was a teenager. And oftentimes I have this feeling, right? Like, why the fuck are you here? Why is this happening to me? I do everything I need to do. I go on my walks. I stretch. I work out. I eat right. Why am I feeling fucked up? And someone else gets to like live like a fucking human garbage can and still have no issues to deal with, right? <laughs> and, and you know, it's yeah. kind of like you're in this kind of argument with these pains, right? And eventually, maybe there's this kind of consensual interaction, right, where they they consent to disappear, right? It's I mean, it's very well done, right? You have you know only two sentences on this, and yet you know, without sort of focusing on this, you get a sense before you even get to the mental state, you get a sense of exactly what kind of body he is trapped in, what kind of life he is trapped in, the body being a symbol for the, you know, the life in general that he's trapped, uh, trapped in. Even like, you know, this unconventional um, description of the bath, I had lain in a hot bath and absorbed its kindly warmth. This is the word of someone that is perhaps not used to kindnesses in his life recently, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, you know, a needs to take kindness from things like the warmth of water, because no one else will provide it in, by some other means, right. And, and, you know, th this, th this only starts to flourish and become more obvious, when all this other stuff that he gets through, you know, is, is, um, you know, discussed more and more, but you get, you know, so much density here in this one paragraph. And also just, I mean, just the fact that, um, when people think of like suicide, right? Uh, they they typically think of like you know perhaps like a, an extreme sort of depressive state or some other kind of form of despair. But this isn't the despair of someone that is necessarily a depressive, although perhaps he is a depressive. But in this paragraph specifically, he's talking about the fact that his life is simply bearable; it's tolerable, right? There is a kind of like odd contentment in these kinds of days. Um, but still that is not sufficient because like, what is the point of ordinary contentment, right? What is the point of, uh, of being lukewarm when you need rapture? And what is the point even of rapture, perhaps, if it doesn't lead to anything greater? And this becomes like later on, you know, parts of the critique that, that Hess makes and Steppenwolf makes is, you know, beyond like being happy. Like he, when he has that conversation with Hermine, he says, you know, I, I don't seek happiness. I don't necessarily even seek a rapture. I, if I, if there's going to be these kinds of emotions, I want it to lead to some, something. I would prefer suffering that leads to something as opposed to a happiness that is a, essentially a dead end. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the fact that this kind of, you know, kind of like a, a, a malaise of contentment can lead to suicide. That is also an unconventional view of, of uh, something like this, this trope of suicide, right? And this phrase suicide, him being among the suicides, when we get to this kind of other, you know, treaties within the treaties, the Steppenwolf treaties within this book, uh, yeah. that becomes a, a very kind of uh, relevant, right? Um, who exactly is a suicide that is still living and never, in fact, perhaps will commit suicide? What does that mean exactly? So, I mean, like in this paragraph, there's just so much stuff that not only in and of itself is just very good, um, it becomes a, a kind of fulcrum for uh, many things that happen later on in the text, right? And, you know, three and a half stars, right? Let's not think about any of that. Um, yeah, 3.5. Well, I, I mean, a couple other points to make on that then. So uh, that sentence you you highlighted, I had taken a powder and been very glad when the pains consented to disappear. There's also the implication that some days they don't consent. Maybe he yeah. takes the powder every day. And it's 50-50 at best. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes they go away. A lot of the times they stay around, hence the bath, right? Try to try to ease the muscles, ease the body with that too. Um, in terms of setting some things up for later on in the text, I think this sentence does that very concisely. I had done my breathing exercises, but found it convenient today to omit the thought exercises. Mm -hmm. So I I did my bodily sensory experiential exercises, but I decided not to do my thinking, which we come to learn is one of 
Steppenwolf's things. He thinks, right? He's always sitting there brooding about something. But today he decided not to do the thought exercises. And even the fact that he's a person who has thought exercises, mm -hmm. how many people have thought exercises? Mm -hmm. I mean, not, not that many, right? So um, he at least is, is uh, he, he's trying hard enough in his life that he's got some thought exercises to put himself through. But today he decided not to do that. And a lot of what happens later in the book is kind of about him doing this, leaving mm -hmm. behind some of this overthinking and breathing, feeling, dancing, moving, uh, mm -hmm. making love, you know, so on. And then uh, just the humor of the way that he sets up that final part of the, you know, the good sentence, according to the 3.5 star review, days when I calmly wonder, objective and fearless, whether it isn't time to follow the example of Adelbert Stifter and have an accident while shaving, mm -hmm. right? So this, this objective, fearless, passive nature of, you know, uh, I'm not even anxious about it. There's no angst, really. I might just sort of, you know, whoop, the razor slipped and, and there I go, you know, and just bleed out. Um, it's, of course, you know, dark humor. But but I, I mean, I laughed out loud when I read that because it's just the mm -hmm. also like the the banality and the contentment and this, you know, everything he talks about again. And for many people, that would be like a great life. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you were not living under. Um, you know, strife and stress all the time. You're like, just have all these kind of nice bourgeois things going on. But to him, it's, uh, it's enough to maybe just decide to have an accident while shaving and let everyone else kind of deal with the aftermath of it. Um, so yeah, those were a couple of things I pulled out of it. Yeah. And there's this, uh, there's other Reddit comment that, that is more appraising, uh, below, um, uh, someone says, holy cow, that is well done. He really slow rolls it. Each of the, quote, boring sentences feels like it has some turn of phrase to make it just interesting enough for you to want to read on. And then he drives home the point nicely, um, which is true. I mean, you know, he he d described in that sense exactly why uh, this, you know, why why this passage works. Right. Um, there are plenty of turns of phrase you could point. And that's the thing, like, uh, like, to, so to, to uh, start, I guess, with some of the Siddhartha comparisons. Um, so Siddhartha is about uh, half or maybe even like a third of the length of, of Steppenwolf. Um, the, the prose is, although like it, it takes a lot from, you know, Eastern philosophy, the prose is much more biblical, I think, than anything else. Uh, and I, well, mm -hmm. I guess like, you know, even like Eastern philosophy, a lot of that prose is, is all, oftentimes biblical too, simply because like spiritual texts, they tend to adopt a kind of similar, you know, like flourishes or whatever. Um, and in Steppenwolf, like there is this kind of density of philosophy, but there are tons and tons of like individual people that come out to deliver it so uh, you mentioned uh, um, in your notes that lots of pomo stuff would like like oh let's let's bring gerda in let's bring mozart in, let's bring nietzsche's characters or whatever but they would just be there to name drop they would just there to be there to like fuck around a little bit then disappear as if right. like haha like that's supposed to be funny but there's really no point that's being made it's not oftentimes it's not even funny itself um but here you know you have characters that, that drop in historical figures that are interesting there's there's dimensions that are now made available to them that would not be available just for the texts you know that they're part of or things that they've written biographies that have been written about them um it reminds me a lot of how in charles johnson uh, when he does ox ox herding tale when um carl marx comes to comes to visit right right uh he, that, that he, he's made into a very interesting character and he's made to be in contrast to, I forget the name of the tutor, uh, Ezekiel, I think his name is the tutor. Yeah, yeah Ezekiel yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Ezekiel, the tutor, is made to be like in philosophical contrast to Marx, right? Ezekiel being made up, uh, Marx being a real figure. And yet Marx is there partly, you know, he has a few purposes there, but one of the purposes is to sort of throw, I guess, a little bit of sand upon Ezekiel and his ego and to sort of set us up to ultimately that thing that he goes through where, you know, he's like, he's supposed to like meet up with a, with, with a woman. And, you know, instead all he has is kind of like a, a dingy house. Right. Um, and and yeah, the kind of taken. Yeah. Yeah. With well, the effect that this has in the psyche, uh, you know, what this means symbolically. So there's like tons of things that happen like that um, uh, in in, in this book, right, where uh, characters mm -hmm. c c come in and out and they offer something new. And because they are these 
people that we already know, uh, they're sort of made to have, you know, a, a denser philosophy than the majority of books. But it's not that Siddhartha is necessarily like less dense in the philosophy, right? Um, no, it's, no, it, not it's, at all. It's, 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 it's perhaps like in some ways equally dense, but there's less, you know, there's fewer names, I guess, like Gautama as the Buddha comes up. Um, uh, and he's there sort of like pilloried a little bit uh, uh, by, by Siddhartha. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, uh, it, you know, in Siddhartha, the philosophy is much more geared towards, you know, kind of like, you know, maybe like what, what Jessica often does in, in her writing, where you have a kind of like more uh, subdued and internal kind of like observational philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas here, you have these like, big grand ideas that are not only coming to play but many of them are coming to be like cut up right and they're coming to be sort of you know you know uh, taken away in some way replaced with other things made fun of you know twisted in some fashion so this is mm -hmm. this is philosophically uh, uh what 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 this book does um instead whereas like i feel like in siddhartha it's much more there's a very kind of uh, there, there's a bit of a narrower, like uh, we, we have like a specific a set of things that we need to do and we're going to get them done by the time that the book is over. Here, there's a lot more that that's open-ended and a lot more uh, potential uh, ambivalence. And you're not exactly even sure what Hess himself might feel about some of these philosophies, right? He opens lots of different play, uh, like avenues to believe one thing versus another thing, right? And it's not it's not so clear cut here. Right. Well, that's that's the best part of it is that, um, and I think that's another piece that maybe he himself commented on this, or you know, it's it's just important to note that you know, it's people want to decide whether they agree with you know the core philosophies presented and uh, any of these given characters. Maybe you know, Holler and the Steppenwolf himself are the ones um, pushing out Hess's personal philosophy uh, into the novel, and it, it's like, well, first of all. He's a complicated enough character that uh, there, it, you can't really say there's one core philosophy going on, and he's certainly churning over plenty yes. of things. But beyond that, it, it just doesn't matter, really. Uh, you know, and we don't need to fish for what Hesse, as the author, is trying to say. He's he's asking questions. He's presenting ideas. He's presenting different avenues, uh, different doors in the magic theater, if you will. And um, you know, it's it, that's what's important. Uh, is that there's there's plenty to work with here. So uh, one other just quick section that I wanted to read, it comes on page 26 and 7, so shortly after that opening paragraph, where um, it's, it's sort of an expansion of these ideas, but it's just, to me, some really lovely writing. So he says, uh, there is much to be said for contentment and painlessness for these bearable and submissive days on which neither pain nor pleasure is audible but pass by whispering and on tiptoe. But the worst of it is that it is just this contentment that I cannot endure. After a short time, it fills me with irrepressible hatred and nausea. In desperation, I have to escape and throw myself on the road to pleasure, or if that cannot be, on the road to pain. When I have neither pleasure nor pain and have been breathing for a while the lukewarm, insipid air of these so-called good and tolerable days, I feel so bad in my childish soul that I smash my moldering lyre of thanksgiving in the face of the slumbering God of contentment and would rather feel the very devil burn in me than this warmth of a well-heated room. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just such like such solid writing there in terms of uh, the imagery used, you know, pain and pleasure uh, being audible, you know, uh, they're not mm -hmm. things you experience, they're things you hear, but they pass by whispering and on tiptoe and then the, his childish soul smashing the molding moldering liar of thanksgiving um yeah so i just i wanted to, to bring that out because uh, that's what we like to do on this show right highlight not, not just the ideas but the quality of the writing itself and, yeah and uh, on that same paragraph at the very end right he gives a sort of a clue right because a lot of people they'd be like well you know why would you be so uh against contentment right what, what exactly is the problem with it? he sort of gives a clue right this gets elaborated on later but he says from what i always hated and detested and cursed above all things was this contentment this healthiness and comfort this carefully preserved optimism of the middle classes this fat and prosperous brood of mediocrity i mean i'm sure that you felt this way uh, i felt this way like lots lots of people feel this way right where they're like you know, am I, am I merely, you know, coasting, right? Am I merely just uh, too content with the way things are? 
are, are the comforts in my life, um, uh, you know, something that is bringing out the best in me, right? Or is it going to bring out the worst in me, right? And you could make an argument that throughout much of the text, uh, his comforts uh, do bring out the worst in him, right? It's not, it's, we don't, we don't dwell too much on his sort of like financial situation. Like we know that, you know, it's not so wonderful that he can like go live in a fucking castle somewhere, but he, you know, he has to like go like take a, a, a room somewhere, be a boarder. Right. Mm-hmm. But we also don't really see him do anything for money. Right. He's just, right. you know, he, he's drinking, he's doing work, but you know, what, what is doing work? Right. Like, what is that? He like read a book for an hour. He read a book for two hours. He right. did, you know, some journaling, like what exactly is work? You know, maybe, maybe he did a translation where he would get paid, you know, like a, a kind of nominal sum. Right. Um, but, and he, and he seems like he's always, uh, out somewhere eating, right. He's always eating out, right. He's never like (laughs) cooking. He's not taking meals uh, with the rest of the family. He's like at a tavern somewhere drinking. He's, you know, like he's, he's, he's dying. He's dining on like fucking liver at some point. And he says something like, you know, I'm not really used to, I'm not really used to eating this liver. It didn't really sit, sit well with me, but the fact that he could just arbitrarily, you know, make that choice. I assume that, you know, perhaps there's a bit more of a, uh, a more difficult thing to procure a hundred years ago than today. Um, right. You Nobody's know, able to do that. Then at some point there's also this like, uh, like little uh, sentence that I thought was very uh, telling and interesting where he's like, yeah, you know, he hates uh, uh, the bourgeois class and he hates the kind of lifestyle, but he has, you know, some uh, uh, notes uh, from some sort of like industrial, you know, companies or whatever that he's, you know, happily and without any sort of guilt, collecting interest on and living off of that interest, right? So it, it, it does seem that he's like, at least partly uh, in, you know, what Nietzsche would, would call like, you know, the worst of all classes, right? The, the, the financiers were able to sort of like live off of speculation um, without doing anything other than having, you know, a certificate of ownership while everyone else like runs the business for you, right? Uh, does everything for you. And you just sort of collect the interest simply because you had that capital to, to begin with, right? Um, yeah. So anyway, like all these like little, like little, you know, nudges and clues that we get, you know, very early on. Um, and I mean, like we could, like, like you could literally just keep turning the pages and you're going to find, you know, beautiful stuff like this on page 29, when he's disgusted with himself and now he's going to go drinking, right? He's so disgusted yeah. with himself that he's going to go out drinking. He's um, got to go out into the, into the night. Yeah. Listen, like, probably... listen, I, I've, I've definitely felt that way before. Like there's been yeah. times, you know, you feel disgusted with yourself. I don't go drink. I would go like go smoking weed and I come back feeling more disgusted. Right. Cause now I smell now I've got to yeah. like gargle and shit. Now I've got to take some pills that are going to like control <laughs> the inflammation that are like in my fucking lungs. So I totally understand all these powders and all these like little machinations in his head right but he's like yeah. disgusted he's going you know, he's going drinking and this is the way that he describes it affecting light hardness i trod the moist pavements of the narrow streets as though in tears and veiled the lamps glimmered through the chill gloom and sucked their reflections slowly from the wet ground i mean like again yeah, and again i, I, I highlighted that exact yes, same yes. sentence yeah yep yeah. yeah. so yeah. good yeah yep yeah. so um yeah, maybe we should just keep going page by page and just seeing what we find. Because I mean, a lot of it is kind of like one thing that we should say is this book is very um, it, the action happens. It seems like at most and maybe a few days to a few weeks, and it's most of him just sort of like walking around first, just kind of like you know meditating on things, eating, drinking, going home in desperation, and then eventually he finds other people to you know be in contact with. He finds Hermine, and he starts you know entering this kind of world of like you know I guess hedonism you could call it. But I mean, in between that, you just sort of like that's the thing. Like you could easily make a book like this. It's so goddamn boring, right? Simply because it's like if you're not yeah. if you're not good enough of a writer to make some of these like banal interactions and this banal sort of stuff interesting, you can't do it, right? But here we could literally flip through page by page and get through, you know, just so much, you know, just like interesting, well written stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll make this argument because uh, I know you have a bit of a time limit. We probably shouldn't go page by page oh, yeah, we because we'll, yeah. we'll be here for eight hours. But if we if we keep uh, humming along 
uh, through maybe to some of our other highlighted sections that uh, we can pull out good writing too. So um, I, the next thing I had was page 44 to 45, just talking about the nature of artists and, and how they create, or at least this is like Holler's interpretation of, mm -hmm. of how that happens. Um, but you had, let's see, you talk about where he happens upon the wall with the door, right? Hey, just just, just a, as, as a plot point, right? So he's like walking yeah. around, he's in a tavern. And then after he gets out, he's you know, he's walking around and he sees this wall that he's always seen. And he notices a door that he hasn't seen. And uh, on it, um, there's this, um, it's like, I think it's like a neon light or something. Magic yeah. theater, entrance not for everybody, for madmen uh, only, right? right? So, so, and this kind of like this, this seems to be like the trigger that if these are all kind of hallucinations and delusions that he has later on, this seems to be like the trigger, the first kind of thing that makes him, you know, uh, uh, be kind of like uh, more uh, uh, privy to this kind of stuff. Yeah. So then he, um, he sort of uh, follows or, or happens upon this gentleman who's, you know, who's walking around and, and hands him the tract where he, you know, it, it turns out to be the Tredis on the Steppenwolf. Uh, and, and so then we get into this section where, he, you know, he's not allowed into this magic theater. He wants to, to get in or he, he's curious enough about it. And, and now he's got this in his hands, which he thinks is going to be, I think, information on it. But it turns out to be this Tredis on the Steppenwolf. So, um, I, I mean, I think just for a moment, we could talk about how this is another interesting tactic here on Hess's part, just as the author, to have this fresh interjection again, you know, kind of another sub layer where, you know, again, keeping in mind, this is supposed to be Holler's records, his, his recollection and recounting of what has happened to him. And he identifies himself as, you know, a Steppenwolf type, but now he's receiving this treatise about himself or, or people of his nature, supposedly. And uh, and going to go through this and have to kind of deal with the the implications and sorting through whether he does feel these things and, and whether they resonate with him. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some some interesting passages in here. I mean, you could again, you could pull out an awful lot from it. I think um, on page 44, this is where I dog eared the page and I said. Um, in this connection, one thing more must be said. There are a good many people of the same kind as Harry, many artists are of these kind. These people all have two souls, two beings within them. There is God and the devil in them, the mother's blood and the father's, the capacity for happiness and the capacity for suffering. And in just such a state of enmity and entanglement towards and within each other as were the wolf and man and Harry. And these men for whom life has no repose live at times in their rare moments of happiness with such strength and indescribable beauty. The spray of their moments happiness is flung so high and dazzlingly over the wide sea of suffering that the light of it spreading its radiance touches others too with its enchantment. Thus, like a precious fleeting foam over the sea of suffering arise all those works of art in which a single individual lifts himself for an hour so high above his personal destiny that his happiness shines like a star and appears to all who see it as something eternal and as a happiness of their own. And it, it goes on from there. I mean, there's more good writing, but um, you know, this to me, it, it brought to mind a couple of things. Number one was our very first artifact on Maslow and uh, you know, toward a psychology mm -hmm. of being and this, this attempt to self-actualize and attain peak moments. And I, you know, you and I argued at that time that when you're, creating as, as an artist there is that sense to it at times um but also this this felt rilkean to me the way that he talks about this and kind of this this beauty of the foam of of the light of the sea being flung out from the artist and kind of using these phrases strength and indescribable beauty moments happiness dazzlingly over the wide sea of suffering um and it's just you know, nice, dense, poetic writing itself here, of course, too, and some of the music that's in this paragraph. But, um, you know, what what do we think of that? I mean, it's interesting to have this in the tract on the Steppenwolf and have Harry be of this kind, and yet to this point in his life, he's done. He's not done this, mm -hmm. right? That's what we're meant to understand, is that he's he's a thinker. He's maybe, you know, had some philosophical posits. He's published some articles. He 
sits around in his bath and reads and smokes and drinks and whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he doesn't seem to have attained any of this. So mm -hmm. him reading it as a treatise on people like himself is an interesting setup. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I also had this uh, highlighted fact that you can have like a little note here, right. That said just great. Right. With like the entire mm -hmm. thing. Um, yeah. and this is, this is, this is a very old highlight from like years and years and years ago. Um, and yeah, so like the way that I would view it is, uh, like, I, I mean, I remember when I, when I first, uh, started thinking about like, you know, maybe I could be a writer, like when I was a teenager, uh, and when I started getting like uh, better and actually, you know, could actually like, produce things of, uh, of some value, like even like before like novels or whatever, I, you know, um, I, I, I always had this kind of like thought of the future, right? There was always this kind of like ever expanding future where like, I could do this, I could do that, I could do this, I could do that. And simply thinking about it, right? And simply, you know, dreaming it um, created this extreme feeling of happiness. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all that different when like I, you know, did my first novel and I was very happy with it. And then, you know, my next novel was very happy with it. Those feelings, you know, seemed in some ways sort of like uh, equivalent. You know, it was kind of like exactly what I wanted to feel um, was precisely what happened, right? Um, and uh, the odd thing here, though, is that, you know, this is someone that is already 47 years old, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, it's kind of like, well, okay, at this point, you should have done something, right? Like, what is that thing that you were going to do, right? What is, what is that thing that you wanted to do? Um, and it's not here yet. And yet he's still, you know, he's still in this kind of like arrested state of mind where he imagines, you know, maybe he doesn't imagine the future for himself, but he, but he at least recognizes the possibility that that could be his future, this kind of extreme yeah. happiness and this, these moments of rapture from doing something worthwhile that could be his future if he actually gets over his issues if he's able to re like reconcile you know his internal problems so that's mm -hmm. that's the way that's the way that i that i viewed it right um you know he he understands that potential is within him and you know on some level this this could also be a clue to you know why uh he sort of is the way that he is like why is he always in this kind of you know, vacillating between contentment and despair well if you feel like you're not really living up to what you ought to be doing whether it's like you know, as a personal feeling, or also just like objectively speaking, you see that you're not doing day to day, we're supposed to be doing, you have all this time. And yet you did one or two hours of work, whatever that was, and you're disgusted with yourself over it. So now you're going to go drinking, you know, you, 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 you understand that there's this kind of disconnect between what you ought to be doing and what you are doing. Um, and that, that mm -hmm. is very painful. Right. So yeah. yeah, but you know, like, 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 and that's the thing, like the philosophy that's presented here, right? It's not philosophy for its own sake. It always goes back to Harry Haller, right? As just a specific instantiation of some of the concepts in this book, fine. But also, you know, to other degrees, you know, he, he turns away from, from uh, um, uh, some of these uh, uh, ideas as well, right? Like there, there's, always, there's always this feeling of character behind it all, moving it along, right? It would be inert mm -hmm. if, there was, if there was no actual reference in this book, that was a Steppenwolf, this would be very inert, right? It would be like, all right, this right, is right. good conceptually. You could sort of imagine this in a philosophical track. You can maybe imagine such a thing in a passage of Nietzsche, but you're, but, but it's not the same thing as, um, you know, as, as a work of fiction. So, yeah. Cool. What, what do you want to uh, go on to and, and highlight next? We're still for a while still we're within the, uh, the tract right the uh, yeah so 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 we get to this point in the tract where uh it starts talking about the suicides i, I mean do you want to tackle that it's just like a, a page after um sure so yeah yeah page um, 47 right yeah yeah go for it if you want to read that part all right so um another was that he was numbered among the suicides and here it must be said that to call suicides only those who actually destroy themselves is false. Among these, indeed, there are many who in a sense are suicides only by accident and in whose being suicide has no necessary place. Among the common run of men, there are many of little personality and stamped with no deep impress of fate who find their end in suicide without belonging on that account to the type of the suicide by inclination 
while on the other hand, of those who are to be counted as suicides by the very nature of their beings or many, perhaps a majority, who never in fact lay hands on themselves. The suicide, and Harry was one, need not necessarily live in a peculiarly close relationship to death. One may do this without being a suicide. What is peculiar to the suicide is that his ego, rightly or wrongly, is felt to be an extremely dangerous, dubious, and doomed germ of nature, that he is always in his own eyes exposed to an extraordinary risk, as though he stood with the slightest foothold on the peak of a crag, once a slight push from without or an instant's weakness from within suffices to precipitate him into the void. And I, I had that specific phrase uh, highlighted, right? Imagine like standing, you know, on a ledge somewhere and a mere nudge, right? Precipitate him into the void, right? Um, mm -hmm. So and that's kind of like a concept that is returned to again and again and again, right? Uh, beyond like the reasons why somebody might commit suicide, you know, aren't there plenty of people that, you know, simply because like they don't have that sort of, personality you know like there, there 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 needs to be something within your personality or within your state of affairs that would allow you to actually go through with, with an act of suicide but mm -hmm. it stands to reason there's plenty of people that either think about it or at least spiritually speaking are in this kind of similar you know uh mindset of of self-destruction right regardless of whether or not they actually do this this thing right which is kind of like it's the melodramatic version of what we're talking about Right. Yeah. But if you could get away from that melodramatic version, don't you still have, you know, that core aspect of yourself, right? That still would quote number you among the suicides. Um, and this is something that was explored in the treaties and just like uh, later uh, on again and again throughout the text and in various uh, ways. Um, so, uh, and it, later on, it said that he he does, in fact, like, you know, come to this uh, sense of wanting to uh, uh, commit suicide, right? Um, like, actually, right? right? So in the treaties, it says, finally, at the age of 47 or thereabouts, a happy and not unhumorous idea came to him from which he often derived some amusement. He appointed his 50th birthday as the day in which he might allow himself to take his own life. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, it's, it's funny, right? It's comical in and of itself. Uh, and to, to call it, you know, not unhumorous, uh, he's being pilloried throughout the text as, as being a humorless human being, right? That's the yeah. critique that Goethe has of him. That's what Mozart, you know, says of him. That's, you know, what, uh, Hermine in some ways, uh, says about him and, uh, the, the 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 fact that the one place where he does derive all this like outside amusement and humor is in this kind of morbid thought um you know it is funny in and of itself right and and this is the this is the extent to which he could sort of tap into humor in his own life right it is kind of telling right and it is also a very kind of effective little statement to make um yeah, yeah and it, it is uh it even harkens back a bit to that opening paragraph of the novel where yeah. uh, you know you can make this argument that if, if now in the treatise he's reading that you can be of the suicides without actually committing the act it's just maybe the way that you live your life and you've essentially snuffed yourself out uh that he seems to have done that right mm -hmm. i mean he's he's so anesthetized with his his day-to-day -day goings on in his life everything seems so boring and and insipid and uh everything else that he might as well be dead in in a sense right um yeah. and so you know i think this is where some of the uh interpretation of the book as as morose and um just uh, a, a downer and about despair definitely comes in but uh, i think what we'll continue to highlight and see as we go forward here is again this this potential the idea that he could change this he he he's got the capacity maybe to do something about it and so then there is some level of hope uh, for Harry. Um, I think, you know, maybe the next thing I would jump to is just page 53, where again, good, good writing here. And some of this discussion about the, the bourgeois tendencies versus maybe what lies deeper within him. So at the bottom of page 53, if we now pause to test the soul of the Steppenwolf, we find him distinct from the bourgeois and the higher development of his individuality. 
for all extreme individuation turns against itself, intent upon its own destruction. We see that he had in him strong impulses both to be a saint and a profligate, and yet he could not, owing to some weakness or inertia, make the plunge into the untrammeled realms of space. Mm. What a great sentence that is. The parent constellation of the bourgeoisie binds him with its spell. This is his place in the universe and this his bondage. Most intellectuals and most artists belong to the same type. Only the strongest of them force their way through the atmosphere of the bourgeois earth and attain to the cosmic. The others all resign themselves or make compromises. So uh, this you know, it's, it's just some some great writing, a few really, really nice sentences in there, but definitely continues to to just go into that next, you know, layer into the philosophy where even if you are of this type, the, the intellectual or artistic type, that's the next level. But after that, how do you break out and attain something more cosmic, move into these, quote, untrammeled realms of space? Um, and that there's, a, there's fresh challenges that await you there. There's more... Mm. You know, plenty of more work that needs to be done um and suffering and, specifically and, right and yeah and that you have to suffer to to attain these things yeah um yeah even on that page right there's plenty of other great things so like you know the others all resign themselves or make compromises despising the bourgeoisie and yet belonging to it they add to its strength and glory for in the last resort they have to share their beliefs in order to live the lives of these infinitely numerous persons make no claim to the tragic, but they live under an evil star in a quite considerable affliction. And in this hell, their talents ripen and bear fruit. And just a bit below that. Um, so the others, however, who remain in the fold and from the, whose talents the bourgeoisie reaps much gain have a third kingdom left open to them, an imaginary and yet a sovereign world, humor. The lone wolves who know no peace these victims of unceasing pain to whom the urge for tragedy has been denied and who can never break through the starry space, who feel themselves summoned thither and yet cannot survive in its atmosphere, for them is reserved, provided suffering has made their spirits tough and elastic enough, a way of reconcilement and an escape into humor. Humor has always something bourgeois in it, although the true bourgeois is incapable of understanding it. In its imaginary realm, the intricate and many faceted ideal of all Steppenwolves finds its realization. Um, and then further on uh, in 55, humor alone, that magnificent discovery of those who are cut short in their calling to highest endeavor, those who falling short of tragedy are yet as rich in gifts as in affliction, humor alone, perhaps the most inborn and brilliant achievement of the spirit, attains to the impossible and brings every aspect of human existence within the rays of its prism. To live in the world as though it were not the world, to respect the law and yet to stand above it, to have possessions as though one possessed nothing, to renounce as though it were no renunciation. All these favorite and often formulated propositions of an exalted worldly wisdom, it is in the power of humor alone to make efficacious. Right? So, you know, there's this... Uh, uh, it's it's odd because on the one hand, um, uh, I think Hess might also himself be making this argument outside of what the book argument is making. Because you know, oftentimes people make that conflation. But you know, personally, like when I'm writing, I often love putting all this like philosophy into a text that I don't necessarily believe because I mean it's it's fun and it's good practice to sort of argue for things that you don't believe and to make it make it believable, make it worthwhile and make it so beautiful that you want pe the people have no choice but to believe it, even if it's bullshit, right? Yeah. That's, that's also a technical feat, right? Um, and, you know, on some level, he seems to be critiquing this uh, uh, notion of humor while also just being very respectful of it in the same way that Woody Allen, right? He says that, yeah. you know, um, you know, tragedy, you know, and drama is, is sitting at the grown-ups table, you know, but at the same time, he's very much a humorist, right? Not only in his like earliest films, but even in his, you know, dramas, there's often uh, tons and tons of humor because, um, you know, there, there is something to it, right? And to be able to combine the two, to be able to have a sort of, you know, tragic countenance and, and tragic sort of orientation um, while also uh, being able to make fun of it, right? To Because I mean, like, like Harry Haller definitely has tons of uh, tragedy within himself. 
And yet he's able to derive humor from the notion of, okay, when I'm 50, I'll just kill myself. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there is something to that, but I mean, like, what did you, what was your uh, perspective on this sort of thing specifically, like the way that humor gets treated, not only these passages, but maybe other ones uh, as well. Like what, like, what is, what is the purpose of that? Like why even, why even invoke humor? What is the point? Yeah. I, well, I think that he, he makes the effort to, uh, to invoke humor because there's, uh, there, there is this sense that, um, if you're going to do these things, if you're going to, to kind of break out and, and strive to achieve something, you know, no question that, I mean, he says humor has, what is it, perhaps the most inborn and brilliant achievement of the spirit. Um, and, and then like also subverts that in the next sentence. But I think he's trying to, to say that this is a, another way that artists can, can work. It's another avenue you have to walk down. It's another option in terms of, um, processing the world and and also being able to to like pin yourself down within it and acknowledge that th there's always going to be this element of th these two things um kind of kind of fighting with each other the, the tragedy and the humor and that that as the uh i guess as the the fate of mankind if you will in a way is is also still humorous you know the fact that there even is this struggle um I don't know if what I'm saying is making the greatest sense because I, I don't I hadn't thought of the invocation of the humor all that much. I was more to your points. I've I've noticed points and, and, and also he doesn't really through, he doesn't really give you know answers that are that easy anyway, right? He doesn't you follow know? up on it much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not a whole yeah. lot more uh, said about it after this point. I don't think. What What do you think? What What was your thought about that? Um, I you know I I think it's like it's it's kind of like that Nietzschean idea of uh you have to be able to fully laugh at yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, uh, uh, you, you have to be able to take things that you do that are comical, right. And silly and stupid and not only recognize them for what they are. Right. Like that's like the first point, plenty of people are not, you know, willing to recognize that aspect of themselves, but also after the recognition, not allow that to, set you off of other goals right whether it's like you know um you know, like reducing some of these tendencies that maybe you don't want within yourself mm -hmm. or going after some of the other things that you that you have within yourself uh uh that you want to that you want to cultivate or you know just like putting putting it into art right there's plenty of things that you know right now you know as i'm going on my walks or whatever tons of observations that i'm making especially if there's like an observation that i'm making that is sort of going off the deep end. And I'm like, fuck, like, why would I even think this? Like, you know, this is, it's so bad to think this or, you know, like, fuck it, write it down, put that into a book, put that into something, make yeah. fun of yourself for going in that direction, recognize it, maybe even give it more depth than you were able to give, you know, on that walk or whatever, but, and make sure that as you're doing it, not only are you laughing at it, but other people are laughing at it. And that does not stand in the way of you. If you want to put tragedy into this book, if you want to do all this other highfalutin stuff, get that in there as well. And don't let this sort of, you know, keep you from going there, right? Because ultimately, yeah. like near the end, like, you know, Mozart does tell him like, you know, you have to be able to laugh, right? Um, let's just like, I mean, since we're on the topic, right? There's this uh, really... Well, uh, and, and real quick too, while you look that up, that reminds me a bit of a quote, um, from a, a photographer I came across a while ago, this photographer, Keith Carter, who's still alive and working today. And I was watching an interview with him where they were asking him about some of this idea, this observational mode, right? And going around and, and taking photos of things and how, um, you know, every photographer does this, I guess, but in, they were showing some of his work specifically and saying, you know, what drew you to this? Why did you, why did you focus on this? And he said, well, at the time, you know, I might not have even really known exactly what I was going to uh, transpose that work into or what the final form would be. But I kind of live by this uh, idea that you should just take the picture and then you have the rest of your life to figure out what it means. Mm -hmm. And so to, you know, to your point, yeah, make those observations, uh, write them down, take the photo, do the sketch, you know, whatever, whatever we're talking about, if it's got an artistic end goal. Um, and, and, and even, you know, laugh at yourself a bit for, potentially the absurdity of, of like 
putting yourself in this position where you have to constantly be observing and taking things in and trying to make sense of it. Um, but, but get it down and then use it later. I, I can't find a quote, but basically it's something like, you know, it, it's, it's very, it's very terse, right. And it's written uh, in a terse way to reflect that We're basically like, you know, at some point, uh, this is what what a life is and needs right it simply is a, a humor and this is the point right um mm -hmm. I, I forget the exact one but but anyway like that 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 seems that, that seems very important because i mean like if you think about it like is there really like a, a truly great works of art that are simply nothing more than self-serious right i feel yeah. like there's always yeah. like some Almost kind over. of like e even if that's kind of like the overriding tendency, um, there's still like always like a little detail and something that uh, kind of, you know, throws you kind of like off the scent in that regard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we, we get uh, uh, plenty of that, um, you know, in, in great, great works of art. And, you know, I'm, I'm it, it has to do with like with age, right? The older that I get, the more and more that I, that I see about this. And I remember like one time, like meeting up with a friend that he hasn't, they hadn't seen me in a very long time. Uh, and, and him like saying something to me. And then he was like, wow, like I, I can't remember like when you were a teenager, you've been very upset if I were to say this, but now you just like fucking laugh at it and you just don't care. And it's true. It's very, it's, it's marvelous how, you know, the older that I get, how little I care about just tons of things. And yet the more, at, at the same time, I'm caring more and more about other things that, that yeah, do yeah, matter. Right, right. Right. Yep. Like I, yep. I, I, I'm laughing at shit that doesn't matter. Right. Uh, you know, and it's like, oh, it, I think of like, oh, this is perfect to put into a book. This is perfect to like get down in some way. This is perfect to like make grander than this kind of like, you know, stupid moment that I happen to be in. Um, and, and, and still and like the seriousness comes from doing something with it. Right. It's not the immediate, you know, response that you have. It's not like, Oh fuck. You know, like I, I, I can't, you know, uh, uh help fill it. like a, a lot of the times, honestly, like sometimes like if I'm like walking around, I have like an interaction with someone that I think was a kind of like, you know, I'm, I am an awkward person, a very kind of like awkward interaction. Um, yeah. when I turn around and I walk the other direction, I I'm always like laughing to myself and they're like, fuck, like that was like really, that was really nice. Like, what is that other person thinking now? This is really good. Um, instead of like being like, like, oh, why did I say that? Like, it's like, no, no, no. What just happened was just so marvelous. Right. So act like it, you know? Um, so, you know, that, that's, uh, and that's what I'm noticing more and more. And, you know, like I first read this book when I was like, what, maybe in my early twenties, um, mm -hmm. I definitely got something out of it even then, but I, you definitely get more out of it in your thirties than you do in your early twenties. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. um, do you want to keep moving along? Cause, uh, I know we've, we've still got sort of a time limit and we're not that far into the book. I think I, in my notes to you, I had said, well, pages 56 through 59, we get some of this commentary about the illusion of the dual nature of the Steppenwolf. Oh, yeah. and, and this is still in the treatise, right? So talking about how, you know, you, you conceive yourself this way. And to this point, the, the tract has talked about things being this way, this dual nature, part man, part wolf. But really, it's, it's way more multiplicitous than that. There's, there's so many uh, different aspects to you. If you were even to then just go into one part of yourself into the wolf part, and think that now you've achieved a unity, you'd find that there's multiplicity within the wolf that you didn't expect. And it's just kind mm -hmm. of this ever branching on and on and on. And, and I, to me, especially just rereading Siddhartha, um, you know, found some parallels there with this idea of, of kind of infinite unity and recurrence and, and all the laughter of the world being the great ohm and the, you know, the laughter of the river uh, later in that book and so on. Uh, what what did you make of of all of that? Yeah, I, I think one thing that we should mention, like to to the extent that there's this um, you know coherence with some Eastern philosophy, uh, th the argument you know throughout the Steppenwolf treatise is as follows. So like you know, so Harry Holler is just kind of like going around uh, in life, and he he always thinks thinks himself as the Steppenwolf, right? Meaning mm -hmm. he's apart from others, right? He's apart from bourgeois life. He's really kind of like disconnected. Um, you know, in some ways, actually, I was thinking like how reminiscent he is of an unhealthy five, right? 
where he, you know, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, he's not only disconnected from the rest of the world, which is, you know, I mean, it's, per, it's perfectly uh, valid to be disconnected from the world, but he takes a lot of pride in it, despite the fact that he has little to show in exchange for the disconnect. I think, you know, if you're going to be, you know, in some ways healthy and you're disconnected from the world, you need to continuously offer something to the world that is rejecting you. You know, like it's, it's right. not enough to right. be rejected by the world and then live in this kind of, you know, resentful, you know, wolf-like existence where you take your revenge on others, you like make fun of others, you know, you laugh at them, blah, blah, blah. Um, you have to have, you know, the wisdom and the respectability and the kind of like, you know, like future thinking to say, you know, I'm rejected by the world, but what that ought to mean is I am rejected for my gifts and I need to offer up these gifts, whether or not I'm rejected. And later on, someone is going to pick up these gifts for me, even if I'm not able to see that in my lifetime, even if, you know, whatever, um, I'm supposed to do that, right? That mm -hmm. is the only healthy way to be rejected by and disconnected from the world um, and, you know, be okay with this and perhaps even to be, you know, in some way satisfied with that. Uh, but for that to be healthy in any way, you have to offer something other than your own disconnect and your own pride at disconnect, right? Cause that, that's going to lead you to the kinds of experiences that he has here. Right. I think that you could make a case that, you know, in these like suicidal thoughts, he eventually does have this, you know, bit of a break from reality. He starts these like elaborate hallucinations, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because he is this kind of like unhe uh, unhealthy five. So to the extent that this coheres with Eastern philosophy, uh, the idea is, you know, you may think of yourself as a Steppenwolf that, you know, represents this or that thing. But in fact, what is also happening is you have tons of other identities. You have tons of other, you know, sort of, you know, branching Steppenwolves. It's not just this one Steppenwolf. Um, and you have to not only live with that, but also embrace it, understand it, find a way to synthesize that with your actual life, with the, ident with the identity that you've cultivated for yourself, right? Find a way to, to you know, uh, make all of that cohere, right? So um, anyway, th th that's sort of like, a, a, I, I mean, Siddhartha does a similar kind of thing. Uh, Siddhartha also has an ending that is very similar to Ox Herding Tale, right? Both of them have this kind of thing where this imagistic kind of, you know, they're, they're both like looking into uh, a, a face uh, in Ox Herding Tale is looking into uh, these tattoos and all the identities mm -hmm. and all the lives and all the existences and all the potentialities and possibilities that others had that the characters themselves have. Um, you see them sort of squirming and you see them kind of, you know, coming into fruition and then you see them dying and you see them being resurrected into something else. Um, right. uh, um, uh, the, the, the ending here is different in that regard, but the idea is, is the same, right? You want to be able to embrace all that um, in, in some fashion. But uh, mm -hmm. one, one thing that is interesting to me is that, so like after the, the treatise is done, um, there's this part where he... Uh, uh, he sort of uh, looks at, um, I can't find it right now, but basically like he, he closes it and then he tells himself, you know what, uh, you know, this was an interesting text. I'm glad that I read it, but I don't think, oh, it's right here. It's on page 71. Mm -hmm. All that was written there of Steppenwolves and suicides was very good, no doubt, and very clever. It might do for the species, the type, but it was too wide a mesh to catch my own individual soul, my unique and unexampled destiny. Uh -huh. And uh, th this is th this is such a clever little thing to add to the end of this because um, lots of people in like depressive states, they say this all the time, right? Like you you ask people that are going through all kinds of turmoil, turmoil, you know, like, well, why don't you, you know, like go to therapy or whatever? And the answer is always, because they wouldn't understand my suffering, right? It's yeah. always like yeah. my suffering is so special. My emotions are so rich. And if you know, if you're someone like you know Harry Haller, who if you if you're an artist or you have like an artistic tendency, it's it's so easy to simply say, um, well, they wouldn't understand it because they're not artists. They haven't thought these thoughts. They're all in this kind of like bourgeois existence. They don't get it, right? And I'm so personally rich 
you know, I have so many other things internally going for me that there's no way that they could like tease it apart. But the fact is, people that are, you know, have a depressive tendency and have like all these other emotional shortcomings, that is identical from person to person that has that shortcoming. Now, they may throw so many other justifications upon it. They might explain it in different terms. They might have all kinds of other self-serving explanations and self-serving motivations for pres presenting things a certain way. But the genesis is always the same. And it's the same for him. Right. And I find it, you know, very interesting that here he says that you know, this is th this isn't enough for me. Right. Yeah. And it's it's more it's more, you know, it's more stark when he says it, because, first of all, he hasn't actually done really anything to sort of justify feeling this way about himself that, you know, I am so complex, whereas others aren't. It seems that uh, up until this point, he's, you know, an academic that's not so different from any others. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe his politics are different. Maybe his level of displacement, maybe his level of success is different. But, it, you know, you, you start wondering, well, is his difference due to the fact that his lack of outward successes is creating resentment? Or does he actually have a set of perspectives that are um, you know, truly uh, worthwhile? So anyway, I, I, I find that a, a very kind of clever sort of, uh, you know, ending to uh, this, this this like I internal tract on the Steppenwolf. Right. Yeah. Um, good. I mean, I don't think I have a whole lot more to say on the, the tract because then we start moving into, um, you know, we start moving into his next set of experiences. Right. Yeah. Um, um, so we can, we can maybe move on to that. Okay. So where, did, where did we leave off? We left off with him, uh, now back, you know, kind of back into the real world and, um, he comes across this old professor and agrees to dinner with him and his wife and, and kind of uh, already knows he's not going to have a good experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, do you want to ta tackle that? Like what was the um, impetus of uh, the meeting? Yeah. Well, so he's uh, I, I, I think he's just walking around through town and runs into him. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so they kind of strike up a conversation. And uh, on page 74, passing by the library, I met a young professor of whom in earlier years I used occasionally to see a good deal. Um, so it kind of goes on and on. And he, <laughs> uh, you know, eventually gets invited to to dinner um, at, at page 75 toward like the bottom third. It says, thus stood the two Harrys, neither playing a very pretty part, over against the worthy professor, mocking one another, watching one another, and spitting at one another. While, as always in such predicaments, the eternal question presented itself whether all this was simple stupidity and human frailty, a common depravity, or whether this sentimental egoism and perversity, this slovenliness and two-facedness of feeling, was merely a personal idios idiosyncrasy of the Steppenwolves. And if this nastiness was common to men in general, I could rebound from it with a renewed energy into hatred of all the world. But if it was a personal frailty, it was good occasion for an orgy of hatred of myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he's, he's just kind of uh, already very upset with himself for agreeing to do this dinner. And then eventually it, it moves on to where he's getting ready to go. Uh, page 77, he's dressing to go out and and visit and so on and then i think in my notes to you i had said on page 78 he makes some comments just about his uh opinion of of academic types in general so this does maybe cast a little bit of doubt on either himself or his view of his former self if he was in fact an academic i'm not sure it's ever made completely clear that he was an academic uh himself is it but it's it's um, it's, it's uh, yeah I, I don't exactly recall either but that's probably no 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 he he did have some kind of professorship right isn't that kind of like what happened okay. to his family life right his wife like leaves him um, okay yeah. and he like loses his job or something yeah so the the professor yeah. was was his colleague right so it must be some kind of academic setting yeah okay there you go so yeah. um. Yeah, so, so then on page 78, he says, On all this, the evening before me afforded a remarkable commentary. I paused a moment in front of the house and looked up at the windows. There he lives, I thought, and carries on his labors year by year, reads and annotates texts, seeks for analogies between Western Asiatic and Indian mythologies, and it satisfies him because he believes in the value of it all. 
He believes in the studies whose servant he is. He believes in the value of mere knowledge and its acquisition because he believes in progress and evolution. He has not been through the war, nor is he acquainted with the shattering of the foundations of thought by Einstein that, thinks he, only concerns the mathematicians. He sees nothing of the preparations for the next war that are going on all around him. He hates Jews and communists. He is a good, unthinking, happy child who takes himself seriously, and in fact, he is much to be envied. And so, pulling myself together, I entered the house. <laughs> a maid in cap and apron opened the door, warned by some premonition. I noticed with care where she laid my hat and coat, and was then shown into a warm and well-lighted room and requested to wait. Uh, that, that's a that's a very <laughs> nice line, right? Uh, yeah. um, warned by some premonition, I noticed with care where she laid my hat and coat, right? As if he knows, like, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. He's going to have to get out of there. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I also very much uh, sympathize with this. I've definitely been in situations where like, I know where this is going to go. Let's yeah. just make sure you have a, a, a very quick exit out of here. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, then, you know, they, they get into this conversation. They, they have the dinner and drinks. Things kind of go on. But um, then this is where there's kind of this moment of humor where he gets so upset and really the whole thing just takes a, a severe turn for the worse to the point where he decides to leave about this um this artwork of goethe right and so uh let's see let's see was it a bust of goethe or a um, painting no, I, I it's, forget it's, a, it's a picture so on, on top picture. of page 79 okay. yeah it okay. chanced to be a small picture in a frame that stood on the round table leaning back on its pasteboard support it was an engraving and it represented the poet Goethe as an old man full of character with Never a again. finely chiseled face and a genius's mane. Neither the renowned fire of his eyes nor the lonely and tragic expression beneath the courtly whitewash was lacking. To this, the artist had given special care and he had succeeded in combining the elemental force of the old man with a somewhat professional makeup of self-discipline and righteousness without prejudice to his profundity and had made of him, all in all, a really charming old gentleman, fit to adorn any drawing room. No doubt this portrait was no worse than others of its description. It was much the same as all those representations by careful craftsmen of saviors, apostles, heroes, thinkers, and statesmen. Perhaps I found it exasperating only because of a certain pretentious virtuosity. In any case, and whatever the cause, this empty and self-satisfied presentation of the age Goethe shrieked at me at once as a fatal discord, exasperated and oppressed as I was already. It told me that I ought never to have come. Here, fine old masters and the nation's great ones were at home, not stepping wolves. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this wears on him. He really can't get it out of his head uh, during their interactions and then on page 81 <laughs> this again this made me laugh when i was reading it unable to get away from him i took him once more in my hands though warning voices were plainly audible and proceeded to attack him i was as though obsessed by the feeling that the situation was intolerable and at the time had come either to warm my hosts up to carry them off their feet and put them in tune with myself or else to bring about a final explosion let us hope said i the Goethe did not really look like this, this conceited air of nobility, the great man ogling the distinguished company, and beneath the manly exterior, what a world of charming sentimentality. Certainly there is much to be said against him. I have a good deal against his venerable pomposity myself, but to represent him like this, no, that is going too far. And then, uh, you know, the, the lady of the house gets very upset at, at his comments about this and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I think in my notes to you, I said, you know, A, this is just a humorous section. Um, it, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, too many people getting this worked up about the way that uh, a philosopher artist is just painted or depicted, you know. Um, so it, it, it's one of these moments where rather, again, than being just a name drop and a space filler in a way to sound smart or whatever, uh, it's good characterization of Harry because he he does care this much, or at least he's he's so frustrated with himself and the whole situation and putting himself there that he he picks something uh, or notices something that he's going to decide to blow up into this huge deal, right? You know, most people would probably be able to bottle it, but he gets all upset about it, and it it does kind of hint that uh, 
potentially Goethe really does mean something to him, right? This is a figure that he's built up in his his life and his inner world, whose work maybe he's read all of and maybe multiple times. And he has a certain conception of him in his own head. And so to see him uh, depicted otherwise is, is really off-putting. And then later on, you know, he has, uh, quote, direct interactions with Goethe uh, as we get to some other parts of the book. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a funny jumping off point. And then th- this from here is where the whole rest of the book really starts to turn because he's so exasperated and upset by this situation that he then goes out and eventually goes drinking right and uh yeah um and meets Hermine so uh so, so I mean e- even in this section right so like a couple of things like he, he eventually does have so like here he has this like interaction you know with this like the surrounds of Goethe right um in a way where it's, it has to be filtered by the people other people observe him whereas later on when he meets, meets Hermine right she tells him to go to sleep and he like nods off um yeah. And as he nods off, he ends up dreaming about Goethe, right? And he has now a, 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 like a less filtered, I mean, it's an interaction that's filtered through his dreams, but he, he, he doesn't have to like worry about all these other people watching him, right? Um, so it, it, th- this comical sort of scene, right? It is a, a jumping off point for, you know, something that happens uh, that's just much more substantive later on. But mm-hmm. also here, like in terms of, um, you know, the, his motivations for bringing all this up, uh, he also, uh, uh, like just earlier, right. Uh, in the night, um, he's also pissed off at the fact that this former colleague of his, he was making this denunciation of, uh, Harry Holler, uh, and he didn't realize that he was doing it because, uh, Harry Holler, uh, ended up writing, um, maybe not, not under his full name, Harry Holler, but Holler was part of it. Uh, he ended up writing this like anti-war tract, right? Yeah, yeah. And the professor um, was like, oh, you know, so like th- this is uh, on top of page 80. Um, then she went on to ask after my dear wife. And I had to say that my wife had left me and that we were divorced. We were glad enough when the professor came in. He too gave me a hearty welcome and the awkward comedy came to a beautiful climax. He was holding a newspaper to which he subscribed, an organ of the militarist and jingoist party. And after shaking hands, he pointed to it and commented on a paragraph about a namesake of mine, a publicist called Holler, a bad fellow and a rotten patriot who had been making fun of the Kaiser and expressing the view that his own country was no less responsible for the outbreak of war than the enemy nations. Hmm, I wonder if we have any uh, lessons to draw for today. Uh, There was a man for you. The editor had given him his deserts and put him in the pillory however when the professor saw that i was not interested we passed to other topics and the possibility that this hard fellow might be sitting in front of them did not even remotely occur to either of them yet so it was i myself was this hard fellow well why make a fuss and upset people i laughed to myself but gave up all hope now of a pleasant evening um, and I mean, th- there's plenty of things in this book, I think, that uh, create, you know, empathy for uh, 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 Harry Holler. But I, I think passages like this especially do because, um, you know, like, for example, we, we know that this book was written uh, or published rather in like 1918, like right after the war. And uh, there's a, there's like there's a prophecy in here. Right. He says, yeah, even now they are starting up the machinery for the next war. They're putting this into motion. So at a time when, you know, I'm not sure to what extent this was like conventional wisdom. I'm sure that at least when it comes to like the elites that are, you know, uh, sort of, you know, doing these treaties and, you know, everything is, um, um, you know, being uh, set up for what they think is going to be an everlasting peace. You know, Herman Hess is sitting there is like, this doesn't look like it's going to be an everlasting peace. In fact, it looks like it's going to be the exact opposite. You know, I'm sure mm-hmm. there were some people at the time that were also making those kinds of prophecies. So here he is making this prophecy. Here he is uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, being criticized uh, implicitly by this professor, really, you know, for no reason, essentially for being right, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, you know, this is one of those things where like, well, do, does Harry Holler have any you know, ideas worth uh, exploring. And I think there's plenty of passages that are directly from his perspective where, yes, he does, right? Um, and and this sort of thing, like, you know, makes you 
uh, uh, root for him in some fashion, even more so not, you know, reading this right after it was published, but, you know, a century uh, down the road, right? You, mm-hmm. you, you especially see how prophetic um, artists could be in, in places that are outside of their purview, outside of their expertise. It, you know, doesn't matter, right? Because, um, you know, for purely being an artist is you have to be able to sort of penetrate into things that are not really, you know, part of your expertise expertise because you're able to cut out the noise you're able to cut out what doesn't really matter and and simply focus on what do you think is the most obvious probability here right this is it's a constant thing that you're doing right as you're writing anyway so um yeah that that's probably the impetus for why he decided to uh, have this sort of a explosion right and and goethe is a nice kind of like stand-in for all the opposites right so we have like you know we have the jingoism and the militarism here right and instead of exploding over that he decides to explode over something that actually matters to him right mm-hmm. um he's like oh you know you think that you're this like you know uh um you know high culture german right because you have this uh painting well i'm also in the same kind of culture as you but let me tell you something you don't understand anything about it all you have to your name is the jingoism and the militarism right? And the culture is just this kind of skin that you put on, right? So you could carry on. And that's the thing, like, I mean, both of these are, are, are you know, in the bourgeois class, they both have bourgeois values in some respects, but um, uh, he's also, you know, like, like the Steppenwolf is perhaps trying to do something with it, right? Whereas yeah. his colleague yeah. is, he's sort of getting lost in books that maybe don't really matter all that much, and uh, using his free time to promote um, essentially what's going to be Nazism, right, uh, yep. in the future. Yep. So, yeah. And after, uh, so he, so he's pissed off, right? They, so he leaves, he storms out, um, and then in this kind of like you know manic episode, he ends up meeting uh, Hermine, right? He notices yeah. this woman in this other tavern, right? Always going to taverns. Uh, yeah, pay, the, pay, bla- the black yeah. eagle. Yeah, yeah. The, the, Bla- the Black Eagle paying for her, you know, for her food, for her uh, drinks, for her, um, you know, he seems, to do- he seems to have some level of expendable income. Um, and so he, he sits down next to her and she seems to immediately understand what he's going through, right? So he says, may I? And asked her to sit down beside her on page 85. Of course you may, she said, but who are you? Thanks, I replied. I cannot possibly go home. Cannot, cannot. I'll stay here with you if you let me. No, I can't go back home. And it's, it's interesting, right? Because he he sort of understands, right? If he goes back home, uh, this might be the final break because he treats this as a final break between himself and society. Yeah. Uh, and this might lead actually to a suicide. And it seems like perhaps in some level, he doesn't want to commit suicide. Yeah. Right? Maybe he doesn't want to see his potential out. And so, um, at, you know, they sit around, they, they start talking. And uh, this is when, you know, really kind of like the, the, the book gets moving in that regard, all the kind of magical stuff starts happening. And here's someone uh, there to, you know, bring out his inner character in a way that he cannot do for himself. Right. Yeah. And, and this begins the journey that he goes on into more of a, a kind of a surface level life in a way, right? Because he's, he's at a pub and he meets a woman and there's a dance going on and he's kind of gets introduced to uh, various people who, you know, maybe do, maybe some of them do have a little bit of depth to them or texture, but um, they're, they're not people like him. That's for sure. Uh, And, and yet now kind of as Hesse does in Siddhartha as well, it's this movement from the intellectual and, and the inner life to and more of an experience of outward life and how that then kind of gets you in the flow of it. And he starts to transform in certain ways. Um, I think I just wanted to highlight this on page 88. So he's now in the flow of this conversation with Hermine and they're getting to know each other. And she asks him to dance and he says, I, but, but I can't, uh, I, I've never learned. And she laughed, but you learned reading and writing and arithmetic, I suppose, and French and Latin and a lot of other things. I don't mind betting you were 10 or 12 years at school and studied whatever else you could as well. Perhaps you've even got your doctor's degree and know Chinese or Spanish. Am I right? Very well then. But you couldn't find the time and money for a few dancing lessons. No, indeed. 
It was my parents, I said to justify myself. They let me learn Latin and Greek and all the rest of it, but they didn't let me learn to dance. It wasn't the thing with us. My parents had never danced themselves. She looked at me quite coldly with real contempt. And again, something in her face reminded me of my youth. So your parents must take the blame then. Did you ask them whether you might spend the evening at the Black Eagle? Did you? They're dead a long while ago, you say? So much for that. And now you're supposing you were too obedient to learn to dance when you were young, though I don't believe you were such a model child. What have you been doing with yourself all these years? Well, I confessed, I scarcely know myself. Studied, played music, read books, written books, traveled. Fine views of life you have. You have always done the difficult and complicated things and the simple ones you haven't even learned. No time, of course. More amusing things to do. Well, thank God I'm not your mother. But to do as you do and then say you've tested life to the bottom and found nothing in it is going a bit too far. Uh, so, you know, it's just a nice dialogue there. Great exchange mm -hmm. between the two of them. And uh, he begins begins this journey of getting to know her. Um, I mean, even in this initial conversation, she says some, uh, you know, pretty harsh things to him, but tries to kind of shake him out of his tree, as it were. So, mm -hmm. um yeah, uh, d d uh, in your notes, you had a comment on, so like Hermine uh, and also Maria, who is uh, her friend, right? And she, she, she offers Maria to yeah. uh, ha uh, Harry, right? As a kind of like, you know, a sexual conquest who ends up, um, you know, like kind of like bringing him out of his shell. They all kind of like learn to dance, they dance together, so on and so forth. Uh, you did uh, have a comment where you treated this a bit negatively, right? Where you were mm -hmm. like, um, you know, like what, what, uh, we've seen this kind of trope all the time, right? It's uh, it's the Kamala figure in Siddhartha that brings mm -hmm. the man out of, you know, his like errors uh, or into like, e even if it's just bringing you from one set of like, uh, uh, you know, like superficiality or like one set of like misunderstandings into like another set of misunderstandings. That is like the function, right? They're not necessarily people uh, in and of themselves. So like maybe you, you could elaborate on, on that critique. Yeah. Well, I think that um, my, my critique of it just, it stems in part from uh, like, like I said to you in the notes, just, just the trope. And I, I don't know that I immediately have like another another stand in for this i mean there's plenty of different things you could do but um i think off the back of reading this and then rereading siddhartha and then thinking about oxfording tail quite a bit uh you know during these these readings and this seems to be the, this idea that like there needs to be some female beautiful female character for this male main character to uh either learn for the first time or relearn sexuality with and this you know, kind of sensuous part of their nature and participation in the world. Um, and I, yeah, maybe there's not necessarily anything in, inherently wrong with it. I just, it kind of felt predictable, I guess, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the, so much of this book to that point had not felt that predictable. It felt fresh. It felt interesting, very vital. Um, and then I think for me, it petered out in that moment where it's like, you know, I, it kind of becomes obvious that her means not going to be the one, at least initially that he does this with, because she, you know, continues to kind of play with him. She'll come in close and then push herself back away and goes and dances with other men and leaves him there to nap on the, you know, cafe table and dream about Goethe and whatever. Um, but, you know, he gets back to his room and it's kind of humorous that all of a sudden his, uh, his little world is interrupted by this new scent. And uh, it's interesting that, that that's how he first picks up on it, too, is by the, a different scent in his room. So, again, a sense coming to the fore. But, uh, you know, Maria is there and uh, he had danced with her a little bit before. And so now, like, she's kind of there as, as this, this means by which he can reenter some of the sensory experience of the world. So um, it just uh, for me, it just felt a little bit flat because I was like, well, OK, kind of, of course, you know, like this old man who's divorced and now there's this beautiful young woman and he can, you know, kind of just have sex with her. And and uh, it just felt too predictable, I guess. And um, there is, you know, there's definitely great writing, which I said to you as well, though, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that does redeem it uh, for me a little bit is that, um, you know, on page 141, it talks about how 
he ends up reflecting on the richness of his life, which sort of stands in, uh, you know, in contrast to a lot of what we've been led to believe to this point and how he's characterized himself. Um, so this is, you know, this is as he's kind of engaging with Maria here. And I know I'm jumping ahead a lot, so we can back up a little bit if you want, but just I'll read this. So it says, um, and so at this page 140 toward the bottom, and so in the tender beauty of the night, many pictures of my life rose before me, who for so long had lived in a poor pictureless vacancy. Now at the magic touch of Eros, the source of them was opened up and flowed in plenty. For moments together, my heart stood still between delight and sorrow to find how rich was the gallery of my life. And how thronged the soul of the wretched Steppenwolf with high eternal stars and constellations. My childhood and my mother showed in the tender transfiguration like a distant glimpse over mountains into the fathomless blue. The litany of my friendships, beginning with the legendary Herman, soul brother of Hermine, rang out as clear as trumpets. The images of many women floated by me with an unearthly fragrance like moist sea flowers on the surface of the water. Women whom I had loved, desired, and sung whose love I had seldom won and seldom striven to win. My wife too appeared. I had lived with her many years and she had taught me comradeship, strife and resignation. In spite of all the shortcomings of our life, my confidence in her remained untouched up to the very day when she broke out against me and deserted me without warning, sick as I was in mind and body. And now as I looked back, I saw how deep my love and trust must have been for her betrayal to have inflicted so deep and lifelong a wound. These pictures, there were hundreds of them, with names and without, all came back. They rose fresh and new out of this night of love, and I knew again what in my wretchedness I had forgotten, that they were my life's possession and all its worth. And I mean, there's more great writing. It just kind of keeps going and keeps going, but I won't go through the whole thing. But um, yeah, so it, it, it does serve an interesting point to... I think the, the one inversion here for me was that um, there's not this sense like as, as he sleeps with Maria and, and they, uh, you know, have sex together that he's immediately like, oh, you know, everything up till now had been so worthless. Now my life had worth. It had purpose. I'm able, like I'm turning over a new leaf. Everything's new and fresh. I mean, there's maybe a little bit of that sense, but it's interesting that what it stirs in him is deep reflection and appreciation for his life mm -hmm. up to that point. And the depth of his experience that, you know, maybe he's simply just cordoned off and decided not to, to engage with all of that is, is dredged mm -hmm. back up for him to, uh, you know, to, to ruminate on. So um, anyway, what, what did you think? Do you disagree with me about, you know, using Maria in this way and kind of, I mean, what, I, 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 I definitely, around? I definitely think there's something to it. Right. Because like, um, it it is common enough, right, in male writing that uh, there's female characters are written in that are essentially kind of like stepping stones for men's like self discovery, yeah. right? Um, you have a little, you know, it, the reverse is a bit less of that. I feel like when it comes to like some of the best uh, women's writing, I don't necessarily find men within it, right, and I don't necessarily find men being the tools of uh, yeah. self-discovery, partly right. because I, you know, I think like for men, uh, um, it may be controversial to say, right. But I, I think that men are probably more romantic than women overall. So they would have like these kinds of like, you know, sentimental attachments to like, I don't know. Uh, it, it could be like total bullshit, right. It could be like, you know, uh, things that don't matter at all. Right. Uh, I've definitely had those like, you know, with like, uh, yeah, you know, like teenage years, like, you know, like girlfriends that I had, like all the, all this stuff that was given and charged much more meaning in a way that, you know, perhaps the other people were not uh, feeling or uh, Dan writes about the same thing, like in, in his memoirs, uh, men definitely, when it comes to women, uh, but that's the thing. It has to be, it has to be a beautiful woman, right? It can't be, right, right. that's right. the thing. It's not, it's not, it's not a woman of depth and accomplishment, yes. right? She needs to have a nice face and that will be sufficient to bring upon this wonderful change, you know, within a man. Yeah. Right. Well, and in Siddhartha, um, she's a courtesan, right? I mean, she's yeah. a, a master of the art of love. Yeah. It's, it's not and, just, and, you know, some other yeah, woman. Exactly. And, and, and here, you know, that's the thing, like Herman, 
Hermine, who becomes like her man, right? Like it's kind of like Aphrodite, uh, um, not Aphrodite, Hermaphrodite, uh, Hermaphrodite, sort of, yeah. yeah, sort of like inversion that's happening then. She's the one that has a depth. Like Maria, like I don't remember if she even like speaks all that much. She's just there to have not sex with him. And the, yeah. the, se- the sex is what brings all this out. But, you know, Hermine has these like other sort of, you know, it's a mixture of like both masculine and feminine qualities, yes. right? Um, but again, Mar- Maria, by virtue of being beautiful and willing to have sex with this guy, this creates a change, right? And th- again, this is a common thing in male writing, right? You know, we're going to have a-, a character that doesn't do anything for you other than just fuck you. And suddenly, wow, the world is going yeah. to change. And, and that, that, that speaks to, you know, male psychology. It speaks to the shortcomings of who, you know, men very, uh, often in fact are right. Um, so, and, and, you know, it's, I don't think Herman Hess necessarily even, you know, escapes it here, you know, like to, to what extent is this like, you know, a personal kind of like wish fulfillment for him. Right. Um, and also there's this kind of like odd thing that happens, like when men, especially when they get older, uh, even if they don't have the same sexual drives because they can't, they become like weirdly lustful, weirdly yeah. like, you know, like you know, pornographic in their approaches to like their, you know, personal likes and dislikes. Um, they, you know, they, uh, they become like very attached to lacking like the physical outlet. They become attached back to that idea of saying about like men being romantic. They're very much like attached back to that, like romantic notion of like, you know, being with someone. Um, Mm -hmm. like I, 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 I feel like, 80 year old women you know probably don't they don't have that kind of thing whereas like w- when you read like that, that that james joyce story and encounter where um there's this kind of like seems like an uh, an off in some ways like old man who like captures this kid he's like a teenager or something maybe younger um and he's like oh have you have you got a sweetheart and he's like so like interested in you know these like questions and these kinds of and it's like when i was young i used to have so many sweethearts right this is the thing that he's sort of reminiscing about and that that's like a common like old man thing that goes on yeah. um you know again open a question like is that you know is that uh something that hess is going through is this a comment on you know um harry holler as the steppenwolf like i mean it could be that as well yeah um but, but yeah, like, I, I think there's definitely something to the critique that, you know, uh, men do certain, well, but also, I mean, like, on, on the flip side, right, I remember, um, like, coming across some, like, I'm not sure if I mentioned this on one of the shows, but there was this uh, book of, like, I, I guess it's like some sort of, like, like, it's one of those, like, sex books, like, Fifty Shades of Grey or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's written by, this one is written by a woman, and it's very interesting to, to see what kinds of things that women imagine men think about when it comes to sex. Because uh, yeah. it's often like, it, it, that's the thing, like, like both men and women are very disconnected from each other, I feel. They don't really mm-hmm. understand each other. So like one thing that this woman put into this, like it's like a sex book, like she 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 tried to imagine herself as this kind of like femme fatale, right? Like talking to this man at a bar and they're like speaking to each other. But she put this from the perspective of the man and the way what the man was saying in the book was, oh my God, suddenly she was next to me and I felt her, her uh, uh, breasts, uh, uh, um, you know, on my arm, boobs, 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 grazing at my elbow, right? Like, 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 ima- like imagining that this is uh, what yeah. men would be turned on and like this odd specific thing, like specifically right. grazing my elbow, you know, that to- you know, total disconnect from the way that men think. But, you know, it is sometimes funny, whether it's like a great book like this with Hess or like these like far lesser things like this, like pulp stuff you find at, at supermarkets, um, you still see all the time, like the ways that men and women like uh, uh, sometimes willfully misinterpret each other. Right. Especially mm-hmm. when like, especially when sex gets involved. Right. Because yeah. there's there, there is something, you know, transactional about sex that happens. There is this like uh, sense of like, you know, uh, winning something or losing something that often gets br- brought into these kinds of relationships. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that's an unfair critique to make of uh, uh, the book here. Although, again, like to your point earlier, also 
like even this is like very well handled in terms of the prose. Like it's very well written. You yeah. know, the conversations that he has with Hermine are well written. Um, yeah. It's too bad that Maria doesn't have like a, a bigger sort of like outer life, but still. Uh, but even her, she has like a little bit of uh, a bit more depth than one might suspect. I mean, you know, she's not someone that's there to like mindlessly serve him, right? If anything, like uh, uh, one thing that uh, Haller is upset about is the fact that she has like all these other men and she's not so interested in him, right? Yeah. And she has her own life. She has her own independence. She has her own uh, set of desires. So that's sort of, you know, it, it's a correction in, in some ways, but but still, you know, I don't think it's a totally unfair critique. Yeah, well, the, the last couple of things I'd say about it is number one. So, so to that point that you just made, that is, if we continue on with this Siddhartha and Oxherding tale as like other, uh, you know, points of comparison here. Um, all three of the, the women that are the fulcrum for change of some kind in these books. So Flo Hatfield in Oxherding tale, Kamala in uh, Siddhartha and now Maria in Steppenwolf. They have had, and you presume will continue to have, many lovers, right? So it's it's not like this, um, it's not a moment where the male character can feel as though like, oh, now I will possess this person or like, you know, we're, we're going to be together and, and this is not like my mate or anything like that. There's nothing deeper to it from that, that kind of a perspective. Um, so that's kind of interesting that it's this, you know, this, you're just one in the flow of many and yet by having this interaction like the, the male character has changed but the other thing there uh is in those two other books um the the change is a little bit different so like here um harry it's it's a surprise you know like this just happens upon him and they have the experience and then things things begin to be a little bit different in Siddhartha, Kamala demands change of him first, right? So they don't have sex together until he goes and starts learning how to be a merchant and engage in trade and have, you know, play at dice and get nice clothes and shoes and perfume his hair, all these other things that she demands first, which are really probably the bigger setup in terms of his ongoing journey uh, mm -hmm. and, and the changes that he makes uh, and realizations that he has. In Andrew's case, in Oxherding Tale, it's a huge change for him because to become Flo's lover means he's no longer really a, a plantation worker, right? She takes him in and he's now like able to live this lavish life. She's completely, uh, you know, doting on him, but demands a lot in return uh, for his performance uh, as her lover, which kind of creates its own humor and these other things. Uh, but then it also builds up resentments from other people at the plantation toward him. And the soul catcher, you know, comes into play after he harms Flo and all these kind of things. So, so there's like, I think just a little bit more nuance. And this just felt to me like all of a sudden, boom, he just goes and gets to sleep with this young woman that Hermione sets him up with. And there's not a whole lot like demanded of him beforehand. Obviously, then things start to happen afterward. But um I just think there's a little bit more density and richness to the other examples of it compared to this one. It, it felt like it just popped up and um, anyway, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of styles, I would say the Oxford and tale is a little bit more uh, in style and tenor, you know, closer to Siddhartha than, than this book is. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's all, it's also shorter, right? So that that's another, well, maybe not that much shorter by a little bit. Um so like yeah, he, both of those characters are much younger men as well. Yeah, it should yeah. be said, you know. Yeah. So, um, I mean, do you, do you want to get to the uh, this uh, theater, uh, this like magic yeah, theater that they're in? Let's talk about um, maybe the the masked ball and and the and the theater. Yeah. So, um, Really quick, I think before we get to that, the only other thing I wanted to point out was just another interesting passage. So again, just talking about dialogue and and the setups. Um, on page 152, let's see, 151 to 152, Hermine and uh, Harry are having another conversation. And so the, he's he's upset about, you know, politics and is like impressed by the way that she's able to see through certain things um 
Page 151, she looked down and fell into meditation. Her mean, I cried tenderly, sister, how clearly you see, and yet you taught me the foxtrot. But how do you mean that people like us with a dimension too many cannot live here? What brings it about? Is it only so in our days or was it, al- was it so always? I don't know. For the honor of the world, I will suppose it to be in our time only, a disease, a momentary misfortune. Our leaders strain every nerve and with success to get the next war going, while the rest of us, meanwhile, dance the foxtrot, earn money, and eat chocolates. In such a time, the world must indeed cut a poor figure. Let us hope that other times were better, and will be better again, richer, broader, and deeper. But that is no help to us now, and perhaps it has always been the same. Always as it is today, always the world only for politicians, profiteers, waiters, and pleasure seekers, and not a breath of air for men. Well, I don't know. Nobody knows. Anyway, it is all the same, but I am thinking now of your favorite of whom you have talked to me sometimes and read me too, some of his letters, of Mozart. How was it with him in his day? Who controlled things in his times and ruled the roost and gave the tone and counted for something? Was it Mozart or the business people? Mozart or the average man? And in what fashion did he come to die and be buried? And perhaps, I mean, it has always been the same and always will be in what is called history at school. And all we learn by heart there about heroes and geniuses and great deeds and fine emotions is all nothing but a swindle invented by the schoolmasters for educational reasons to keep children occupied for a given number of years. It has always been so and always will be. Time in the world, money and power belong to the small people and the shallow people. To the rest, to the real men belongs nothing, nothing but death. Nothing else? Yes, eternity. You mean a name and fame with posterity? No, Steppenwolf, not fame. Has that any value? And do you think that all the true and real men have been famous and known to posterity? No, of course not. So just an expansion a little bit on some of the other earlier themes we talked about. But, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's great character sketching for Hermine, right? This depth that she has to her, this ability to think and prod around with Harry, uh, in addition to, you know, showing him more of the the sensory life and these other experiences, but um, interesting that, you know, she, she's able to point out to him that there's uh there's more to it than just fame and, and, uh, and fortune, so to speak, you know, it's, it can be important enough just to live with achieve your own achievements and the consistency of your personality. Yeah. I mean, there, there's very much a kind of like, you know, realist idea here where, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes wonder, uh, to what extent, uh, and this is like a, a central theme in, in the book I'm working on now, like to what extent can we in fact say that, uh, this like true achievement and this, you know, greatness of, um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's like cultivating a talent, like whatever, uh, how, how sure are we that it, it in fact will be celebrated, will live on, right? I mean, it's sort of uh, easy to take the opposite perspective simply because like, you know, we live in a period where uh, just more and more that, you know, there's like no incentives for like great art, right? There's, there's just nothing. Um, and you look back in history and you're like, well, you know, we, do, we have preserved enough great material that we could all, all, all point to that suggests that maybe there is something to it. But uh, I think it is still an open question, especially as, you know, uh, the time moves on, um, how much of this will be held together? How much of this will, will, uh, uh, matter. Right. Um, and, uh, if, if you start really thinking about that, the problem is if you are someone that is capable of doing something worthwhile, it becomes very easy to, uh, justify like laziness or like not doing anything or just sort of, you know, lying around and labeling, like, you know, what, what gives me pleasure is just, accumulating knowledge. So like, I'm not going to write, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. All I'm going to do is just read, 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 and just sort of titillate myself until I die. Right. Mm -hmm. There's always that inclination when you start thinking about the possibility of, um, you know, they're not being this kind of, uh, uh, you know, celebration of the right things, Mm -hmm. right. Uh, Ideally you're, you're doing things not merely because like, Oh, you personally want to be celebrated, you actually want to have something to offer that is celebrated. And then, you know, it feels great if you are then yourself also celebrated for it, but you can't just like 
you know, want it just for the sake of wanting it. You have to offer something in exchange. You have to be able to give something to the world. You can't just say, I want this and I'll, and I'll give you nothing in return. Um, and, uh, uh, so, uh, wait, what, what was this in connection to, um, turning to the back of time, this is the kingdom of yeah. truth. Uh, Anyway, it'll, it'll, it'll probably uh, come to me after, but there was some other point that I, uh, I wanted to make in, in relation to this. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, but you know, th this is sort of like the, the idea and this does get played with uh, throughout the book. Oh, the other connection I want to draw to is, uh, I'm not sure if you saw the movie uh, Harakiri, but uh, the way that uh, it ends is, uh, this is Kobayashi's Harakiri. There's, I think a more recent one, but anyway, uh, in in the Kobayashi film, the way that it ends is so you know there's like these samurais that that have this like very sort of a unjust um, kind of relationship with uh, you know the rest of their kind of like village or whatever, um, and so uh, 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 this this uh, this uh, father uh, whose uh, son dies who has like a like a, a little son, um, he decides to get his uh, revenge in these samurais. And ultimately, when they kill him, what happens is there's this like very, very quick ending where the samurai house, they, they simply get together. They try to erase all traces of his history. They try to erase what exactly has transpired. They sort of write over this history. They give this explanation that becomes the pat explanation that will be the thing that's carried out because, you know, they're the ones that wrote it down. They're the ones with the power. Um, and so this true history, right, that she's alluding to, like, forget even like the, the people, you know, that, that are, let's say, deserving of fame or whatever, just the everyday kind of, you know, courageous person that you might have, or the mm -hmm. everyday hardworking person, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the person that's working, you know, in safe conditions, 16 hours a day you know, to mine, you know, the minerals that make it into our, you know, fucking phones or whatever, so that we could download dumb apps and like, you know, waste time on the train or whatever, you know, or whatever it is that people do. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 th those people, you know, they get sacrificed, right. We, we've set up a society in such a way where they are meant to not be remembered. They are meant to not be celebrated because in bourgeois society, if you see suddenly all these celebrations, you know, if, if you come out with some fucking holiday, like today is going to be, you know, uh, this week is going to be slave labor week where we all come together and we say thanks to everybody that is on slave conditions today, feeding us, giving us our gadgets, making us happy, right? Nobody would be doing that because they would rather not be reminded at all, right? Yeah, the, only, yeah. the only things that would give like a week or a month to are things that we could safely put in the past. Like what is Black History Month? It is everything up to today, right? Today is no longer history. No, no, no. What's going on in black neighborhoods? That's not subject to history. That's not history. There's no causal chain there. The all, all everything else is history. Slavery, yes, that's history. But no, no, no. Today is disconnected. So nobody wants a reminder of today. And to the extent that we get reminders, they're always phrased in the world of yesterday, right? In the language of yesterday. No one wants a, a reminder of today, right? So, um, Anyway, these are these are the thoughts that all of this mm -hmm. uh, brings to mind for me. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to jump ahead to him going to the masked ball now? Um, you know, he's he's judged by Hermine or Hermine to uh, have danced enough and and developed enough dance skill over the past few weeks to now mm -hmm. come to this masquerade, and uh, he's nervous about going, but but he goes for it and shows up there and. Uh, it sounds like a rager, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a pretty good time. <laughs> a lot of, yeah. a lot of bombastic music, lots of dancing, lots of, uh, you know, general hedonism and pleasure seeking by everybody involved. And, uh, then it, it gets more serious from there. So you want to, yeah. You want to jump um, in? Yeah. I thought this was a nice little description on, on the uh, middle of page of 167. So going back to this idea of men uh and when i say you know men are the more romantic ones this isn't uh this isn't like me praising men for being more romantic than women i'm saying this in a negative sense right in the sense that uh if you exaggerate the romance like it, it has nothing to do with reality right so in, in this uh, passage you, you're just kind of like wondering well um 
you know, like, oh, would a woman feel this way? Because here, you know, like, her, like uh, uh, Harry is like dancing with all these women. And he's feeling all these transformations happen. And you wonder, well, would, the, would he be feeling this if he was not dancing specifically with women? To what mm-hmm. extent are his like old man lusts, or rather middle, middle age lusts, sort of occluding his vision in terms of like what exactly he's getting out of this or what this means for his life. But anyway, this is the description on page 167. We sat and talked and drank champagne. We strolled through the rooms and looked about us. We went on voyages of exploration to discover couples whose love making it amused us to spy upon. She pointed at women whom she recommended me to dance with and gave me advice as to the methods of attack to be employed with each. We took the floor as rivals and paid court for a while to the same girl, danced with her by turns, and both tried to win her heart. And yet it was only a carnival, only a game between the two of us that caught us more closely together in our own passion. It was all a fairy tale. Everything had a new dimension, a deeper meaning. Everything was fanciful and symbolic. There was one girl of great beauty, but looking tragic and unhappy. Herman danced with her and drew her out. So here, Herman is now being called Herman, H-E-R-M-A-N, which is uh, um, based on a, a childhood a friend that he had named Herman. Um, and she shows up to the masquerade as a, a dress as, as a male, right? So uh, that's kind of why this change occurs. So Herman danced with her and drew her out. They disappeared to drink champagne together. And she told me afterwards that she had made a conquest of her, not as a man, but as a woman with the spell of lesbos. For my part, the whole building reverberated everywhere with the sound of dancing and the whole intoxicated crowd of masks became by degrees a wild dream of paradise. Flower upon flower wooed me with its scent. I toyed with fruit after fruit. Serpents looked at me from green and leafy shadows with mesmeric eyes. So I, I feel like, you know, later on, you know, as this passage goes on, when you get like the serpents or whatever being introduced, um, there is this kind of like veneer of uh, negativity, right? There, uh, it, it's not, you know, th- this, this, uh, you know, like self titillation is not all positive, right? There is definitely a sense of this is all leading uh, somewhere where it, it shouldn't be going. And then ultimately, when he, you know, sort of like follows uh, her means directive that ultimately she wishes to be killed, and he, mm-hmm. you know, stabs either her or her kind of like image um, uh, with a dagger. Um, you know, there is this there is this kind of sense of like excess, right? Uh, later on, we have this like wonderful little passage of uh, he uh, uh, meets someone while all these like uh, cars are you know crashing into one another as uh, uh, they are sort of you know shooting the the drivers, and the idea is they want to destroy the machines, right? The machines they're in a rebellion yep. against them, themselves, right? So this you know this is kind of like. Um, when, when you see some of the kind of like uh, artistic uh, movements in the early to mid uh, 20th century, right? There's this kind of like rebellion against, you know, the depersonalization of, uh, of machinery. Um, and, and this has like a nice little recap, in, in, you know, in literary fashion um, that, that that is also like, you know, it shows the excesses as well, right? It shows this kind of like, well, you want to escape you know, this machinery, right? Like, like the Steppenwolf is very often, like he hates the modern age. He, he seems to very much dislike technology, whether it's like the gramophone, like, oh, why do we have radios? They, they really, you know, mess up the sound of like a, a great work of music. Um, but he, you know, you also don't get the sense that he wishes to replace that with anything better or more worthwhile. It's like, okay, right. so if you get rid of the radio and you want something else, you need to, on the one hand, be able to, keep this idea of like you know uh the masses are able to be part of it but you want to replace it with something else but i think the idea is not so much like the sound is of poor quality it's because you don't want the masses to be involved right you there's like mm-hmm. a, kind of like a resentment there right you're outside of this fold you're a steppenwolf you don't want the masses uh, involved same thing with his like you know criticism of the goethe portrait like he doesn't make any like objective critiques of the painting right it just seems as if like well that's not that's not my personal Goethe. That's not it's my not hero. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's yeah. not how I feel. A lot of it, ironically, although he wants to be dispassionate, a lot of it just goes back to all his like really turgid and sort of toxic feelings about the world 
being, you know, a kind of stand in for depth, right? He yeah. often, he, he often just uh, ha has that problem. And you see this kind of, you know, uh, recapped in kind of more stark fashion uh, in some of the kind of magical things that occur in the ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a good point you make about his, um, his, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, criticism of the the gramophone or the radio in terms of maybe it's because it's now able to get out to a broader audience versus just he literally is an audiophile and he you know thinks the sound quality is bad um because it it could be that part of yeah, part of his journey that he's he's really meant to be on with all this is to understand like something like a great work of art yes uh he as the, the steppenwolf type is maybe predisposed to want to seek that out to find value in it beauty realize that you know the artistic um sensibility and quality behind it and so on but if he were really to like think more broadly and positively about the effect of such things it it should reach more people right mm -hmm. he, sh he should want if there's going to be more Goethe's and Mozart's and Brahms and, and Einstein's and whoever, you have to cast the widest net possible to, to have more people exposed to this stuff. And yeah, most will not get it. It will pass mm -hmm. them by. They won't care or they won't be able to grasp and that's fine. Um, but yeah, the, the, the selfishness, if you will, of him wanting to hoard something that is for all, for all people for eternity, um, is is an interesting take i hadn't really thought of that before but it's definitely a point that he of growth that you know he needs to engage with so yeah i mean he, th that's what i'm saying about like those like those type five qualities that he has right yeah he wants to like yeah. so badly like you know like grip gertz and all these names and all these things like this is for me only for me only for me yeah Probably, he wants to be a mozart hipster yeah. you know yeah like i'm the only and, one who knows about this mozart guy and, and this ha this probably has to do with the fact that he recognizes that up to this point he had he doesn't have any real contributions all he has is the gatekeeping right all he has is the ability to grip everything closer without you know allowing it to you know come out in some way so the best that he could point to is like well that person is never going to get it that person's not never going to get it at least i understand this even if i can't actually make anything of it right yeah. beyond this like you know totally kind of sterile um and maybe throw a little too harsh because again to the extent that he has these like thoughts right they are often well crafted you know uh worthwhile thoughts that he has but the question is has he ever decided to get them on paper prior to writing this book right yeah um yeah. and that's really the only relevant thing yeah well and it's it's yet another good uh, there's so many examples we've given and talked about but since we're on it right now and another good example of how adept Hesse is at characterization and writing a good novel here because you know in in the misinterpretations and misreadings like what we almost started all this off with and then you know the ways that people have misinterpreted it over the years to the point that Hesse himself felt he needed to step in and say something about it is just this wanting to read it with only one maybe two layers um rather than to understand Harry as this complex character who's got admirable qualities deplorable qualities some tragedy some humor some you know some potential some lost potential all of these different things that feed into his personhood that he's you know that he's trying to sort through here um because i th i think when i read through this book it's like a lot of the the philosophy that's put forward and even some of the passages we've highlighted like you and i would agree with that philosophy in large mm -hmm. part right and we've talked about it in other shows here and whatever but certainly to many people have probably come across as like you know too proud too highfalutin uh, the, uh, the the word you like to use sometimes um too insular too steppenwolfish right uh, just this person who has you know uniquely good capabilities and then wants to just uh, basically shut out everybody else that he thinks is worse than him uh, and kind of just be an, an asshole or whatever. But, um, you know, the, the truth of it is that there's, there's just a lot more to the dimensionality of Harry's character than that. You know, you, you, it doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort to just continue to, to mine and, and dig deeper uh, on the way mm -hmm. that Hesse draws him out. 
here over the course of the book. So, yeah. Um, do you have anything we're getting closer to like the end of this, uh, thing, right. Um, yeah. this, uh, like sort of like internal sort of, uh, episode with the magical theater. Um, do you have yeah. anything to say about the Pablo character? Cause, uh, at, at least in the beginning. Right. And I think this is, uh, perhaps in some ways an inversion where, uh, Pablo who, you know, he's, uh, um, he, uh, he, he's, he's presented almost like a, like a noble savage at the beginning, right? Yeah. Someone that is like beyond engaging anyone, right? But he has like this understanding. So when Harry has like all these like fanciful things he wants to say about uh, the arts or about like, you know, praising this or that, you know, element of jazz or like whatever it might be, um, Pablo just sort of like nods along, like with understanding. Or if he sees like Harry getting like too worked up, he's like, "Oh, here, like t take a take a hit of this, right? Whatever it is that they're smoking." Yeah. Um, and 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 uh, so he has this kind of like almost like noble uh, savage kind of quality. And I'm not sure exactly what his skin color is, but he's made to be, you know, if not uh, non-white, at least foreign, right? His name Pablo, right? He's like the, uh, yeah. you know, like, uh, the, the, maybe like the, the Moorish Spaniard or whatever. I was going to say, I, I kind of pictured him as a Spaniard personally. When yeah, I was reading. yeah. Yeah. And, and from yeah. what I've read, like, I think, a, uh, um, the, uh, the character allegedly was like supposed to be based on a Sydney, uh, Betchett, right. Um, uh, and it's like, you know, like, well, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a black person. So I, I always like imagined a Pablo, you know, being non-white simply because at least at the beginning, there's this kind of like exotic thing going on. But uh, as, as the book uh, goes closer to its end, Pablo is engaging Harry on Harry's own terms on his like highly intellectualized terms and, you know, offering those responses and showing that, you know, I'm not a noble savage. I've just simply transcended uh, some of these arguments that you want to have. So I just don't have those arguments anymore, right? I've been through yeah. that. It seems like Pablo's presented not uh, ultimately then, not as someone that is like this kind of a, you know, ultimate sort of exotic, but uh, someone that to whatever extent is exotic is only that way because he's already been through maybe some of the experiences or at least some of the spiritual struggles that uh, Harry has uh, uh, experienced, right? Uh, up until this point. Um, but has actually worked through it, right? Has actually forged the identity that he needed to. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's definitely something to that. Um, I think the, uh, both Hermine and Pablo, uh, to me have, have a bit of similarities between them because it is this deeper person than what you first think on the surface when you're encountering them. And of course, um, earlier in the novel, Harry's quite frustrated. With the character of Pablo. He's probably mm -hmm. almost certainly envious of him, right? He's very handsome. Women are drawn to him for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, he's this uh, trumpet or sax player type and also seems to conduct everybody. They'll kind of follow his lead. So he's clearly uh, artistic. He's musical. He's got something to offer that way. Uh, plus his looks and, you know, presumably an experienced lover and all these things that Harry doesn't see himself as, right? So he decides, I want to try to engage Pablo on these intellectual topics, and then he doesn't get much from it, you know, early on, and sort of writes him off. Um, and again, it's it's one of those times where you're like, this is sort of a bad look on Harry, right? You know, like he just, since he can't wax on with you about whatever, like, obscure you know, Norwegian philosopher you're reading, you right now, you don't think that he's like, you know, worth your time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely notable that here, he seems to run the magic theater, first mm -hmm. of all, right? He's the one that invites Hermine and Harry into it. He gives them instruction on how it should play out. And then I highlighted in my notes to you, one of my favorite passages in the whole novel. So if you'll indulge me, I'll read through this. It might take a couple minutes, but pages 191 through 193, where Harry's kind of, he's disoriented now. He's gone through a few of these different doors and is, you know, is it a dream world? Is it memory? Is it uh, fantasy? We don't really know what's all going on. Some strange things, some disturbing things are happening to him in there. So he's trying to decide which one to go into from the corridor. And it says the series of inscriptions was endless. One was guidance in the building up of the personality, success guaranteed. Um, and this seemed to me to be worth looking into. And I went in at this door. 
I found myself in a quiet toilet room where a man with something like a large chessboard in front of him sat in Eastern fashion on the floor. At the first glance, I thought it was friend Pablo. He wore at any rate a similar gorgeous silk jacket and had the same dark and shining eyes. Are you Pablo? I asked. I am not anybody, he replied amiably. We have no names here and we are not anybody. I am a chess player. Do you wish for instruction in the building up of the personality? Yes, please. Then be so kind as to place a few dozen of your pieces at my disposal. My pieces? Of the pieces into which you saw your so-called personality broken up. I can't play without pieces. And again, of course, this harkens back to that. You're much more multiplicitous and dynamic than just the dual nature of the Steppenwolf idea. He held a glass up to me, and again, I saw the unity of my personality broken up into many selves, whose numbers seemed even to have increased. The pieces were now, however, very small, about the size of chessmen. The player took a dozen or so of them in his sure and quiet fingers and placed them on the ground near the board. As he did so, he began to speak in the monotonous way of one who goes through a recitation or reading that he has often gone through before. The mistaken and unhappy notion that a man is an enduring unity is known to you. It is also known to you that man consists of a multitude of souls, of numerous selves. The separation of the unity of the personality into these numerous pieces passes for madness. Science has invented the name schizomania for it. Science is in this so far right, as no multiplicity may be dealt with unless there be a series, a certain order and grouping. It is wrong insofar as it holds that only one that one only and binding and lifelong order is possible for the multiplicity of subordinate selves. This error of science has many unpleasant consequences, and the single advantage of simplifying the work of the state-appointed pastors and masters and saving them the labors of original thought. In consequence of this error, many persons pass for normal, and indeed for highly valuable members of society, who are incurably mad. And many, on the other hand, are looked upon as mad, who are geniuses. Hence it is that we supplement the imperfect psychology of science by the conception that we call the art of building up the soul. We demonstrate to anyone whose soul has fallen to pieces that he can rearrange these pieces of a previous self in what order he pleases, and so attain to an endless multiplicity of moves in the game of life. As the playwright shapes a drama from a handful of characters, so do we from the pieces of the disintegrated self build up ever new groups with ever new interplay and suspense and new situations that are eternally inexhaustible. Look, with the sure and silent touch of his clever fingers, he took hold of my pieces, all the old men and young men and children and women, cheerful and sad, strong and weak, nimble and clumsy, and swiftly arranged them on his board for a game. At once they formed themselves into groups and families, games and battles, friendships and enmities, making a small world. For a while, he let this lively and yet orderly world go through its evolutions before my enraptured eyes in play and strife, making treaties and fighting battles, wooing, marrying, and multiplying. It was indeed a crowded stage, a moving, breathless drama. Then he passed his hand swiftly over the board and gently swept all the pieces into a heap and meditatively with an artist's skill, made up a new game of the same pieces with quite other groupings, relationships, and entanglements. The second game had an affinity with the first. It was the same world built of the same material, but the key was different. The time changed. The motif was differently given out and the situations differently presented. Uh, and it just kind of continues to go on and on from there. But, um, you know, I just, I think this is, again, wonderful writing, um, but definitely gets to some of the continued philosophy and melding together both western and eastern thought uh you know that, that has has employed here and also employed in siddhartha i told you in my notes that to me pablo did have some uh affinity with vasudeva the river man who really is kind of the the jumping off point for siddhartha's final evolution uh toward toward enlightenment and understanding of the world and same idea, right? This person who has kind of mastered one particular art that doesn't seem to have a lot of worth to many other people. I mean, there, there's a passage toward the end of Siddhartha where Vasudeva is talking about the thousands of people he's taken across the river over the years and less than five maybe have ever thought the river itself had value and wanted to learn from it and, and be by mm. it. Uh, it was always just a barrier or an obstacle in between things. And so, um, 
you know, if, if we take Pablo either to be the, the gatekeeper of the magic theater here, or maybe he kind of is or seems to be ish uh, or has, you know, similar characteristics with the chess player here and everything else. It's to your point earlier, this person who maybe has tread this ground themselves before and is now trying to help somebody else to do the same, um, but let them, let them come to it eventually in their own way and just understanding how multiplicitous uh, things are. You know, I, I, this idea that, that Hesse has a lot at the kind of the center of these things of not really like a, a battle between, but a, a fluidity between both the unity and multiplicity, right? Mm -hmm. Out of the one many, out of the many one, and, and how these things kind of eventually come together. Uh, that's really, again, as we said before, he's not so much, he's not giving an answer. He's just saying these, these are, there are different ways to think about this. Um, but yeah, great passage. Yeah, uh, just rereading this and also some of the other uh, stuff, um, like he's looking at, you know, this mirror with all the multiple fractured selves. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still, you know, just like in Siddhartha and also Oxford and Tale, um, it seems like texts that do deal with these philosophical themes, uh, they do have that kind of a technique of physically, like trying to physically represent that, right? And, and yeah. uh, um, you know, whether it's like looking into the tattoos in, in, in Ox writing tale or, you know, something like this, uh, that seems to be uh, common enough. I wonder if at some point uh, this is like getting closer and closer, like at least not back then, right? But in the modern day, if you were to write books like this, it would probably would be starting to get closer and closer to, you know, narrative cliche to invoke mm -hmm. similar techniques. You know what I mean? You can't, you it can't, yeah. like you, you, you can't, uh, like it's, you know, Charles Johnson was able to get away with um, essentially taking large chunks of the Siddhartha ending because he did it, you know, with a different, uh, different prose, uh, different style, different, uh, you know, underpinnings. The fact that there's this kind of like, you know, black, uh, slave narrative as well. Um, yeah. But it, it seems like you you can't just easily do this kind of thing anymore. And if you try, it, it probably can't be like the ending to a book and it can't be like the critical portion of a book. Um, yeah. But but that's like, it's, 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 it's interesting to think about how all of this starts to like, you know, come together in real time, right? What, mm -hmm. what, what, what will be the future jumping off points? Like, what can they look like? What can't they look like? What would be a legitimate critique of them? What would not, right? Um, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it is very uh, distinctive, right? How uh, all, all three of these books end up uh, trying to go for this uh, similar kind of writerly uh, technique. Um, and I mean, so like, we're, we're pretty close to, uh, the uh, the end here uh, was w w was there anything uh, from like the last twenty pages or so that you had highlighted? I have I have some stuff if you don't. Yeah, you can. I just obviously went on for a long time with that passage, so go for it with whatever you've got there. Yeah. So ultimately, right? Uh, you know, of the various um, heroes that he has, uh, Goethe among them, Mozart is also one of them, right? Um, and mm -hmm. uh, Mozart, like pretty much everyone else, right, is trying to get him to laugh, right, to like not take himself so seriously, to find things about the the world that are sort of, you know, uh, amusing, right, and are uh, have utility there. Um, mm -hmm. And so a after Mozart like confronts him near the end, uh, this is on uh, page 213, uh, this idea of the radio and the gramophone and the fact that, you know, it distorts sound, right? Uh, that is being brought up again and it's yeah. also called uh, irrelevant, right? And there's a couple of things going on that, that, that are interesting. Like on the one hand, um, Mozart is not making the critique that I made, right? He's, uh, instead he's saying uh, that, you know, it's irrelevant, right? Whether or not this is uh, uh, not the sound that you're looking for. Um, at the same time, right, he is presenting a completely separate kind of argument as well that that is interesting in and of itself. So uh, this is this is what he what he tells him. Listen, then, you poor thing. Listen well. You have need of it, and now you hear not only a handle who disfigured by radio is all the same, and the most ghastly of disguises still divine. You hear as well, and you observe, most worthy sir, 
a most admirable symbol of all life. When you listen to radio, you are a witness of the everlasting war between idea and appearance, between time and eternity, between the human and the divine. Exactly, my dear sir, as the radio for 10 minutes together projects the most lovely music with that regard into the most impossible places, into respectable drawing rooms and attics and into the midst of chattering, guzzling, yawning and sleeping listeners. And exactly as it strips this music of its sensuous beauty, spoils and scratches and beslimes it, and yet you cannot altogether destroy its spirit. Just so does life, the so-called reality, deal with the sublime picture play of the world and make a hurly-burly of it. It makes its unappetizing tone slime of the most magical orchestral music. Everywhere it obtrudes its mechanism, its activity, its dreary exigencies, and vanity between the ideal and the real, between orchestra and ear. All life is so, my child, and we must let it be so. And if we are not asses, laugh at it. It little becomes people like you to be critics of radio or of life either. Better learn to listen first. Learn what is to be taken seriously and laugh at the rest. Right? Um, I, I mean, this is kind of like in some ways uh, pure Nietzsche, just in very different terms and perhaps kinder, right, than Nietzsche uh, would uh, uh, try to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it's, it's, just, it's one of those things where... Uh, like, I feel like you get like very much a similar kind of strain today, right? Now people can't really complain about the sound of the radio in a pure sense because it's not distorted, right? Uh, um, vinyl mm -hmm. records aren't really a uh, uh, distortionary either. But one thing that I do notice now is like, people like, oh yeah, like I can't, you know, listen to music like on my phone or my headphones on the computer. I need to like see it live to really appreciate it. That's that's like the new fucking thing that people do. The new thing that people mm -hmm. do is I gotta go watch this live, right? They they need to they need to gatekeep some other way because it's no longer tenable to do it, you know, in the former ways. Um and to me it's always like, you know, like I guess you could get certain things that a live live music that you can't get elsewhere. But personally, um I want to like sit back if I could have my headphones on and just be alone with my thoughts without like smelling anyone next to me, without seeing yeah. anyone else next to me, without having to yeah. deal with like, like being anywhere other than in my own mind and my own body and this thing that I'm engaging with without any distractions, I find that ideal, right? But, um, you know, uh, uh, not, not having necessarily so much of your own self to engage with. I feel like people now more and more the, the the new thing now is is okay it's live or it's bullshit you know we see the same thing with like you know mm -hmm. abex painting oh you think it's bullshit you got you got to go up you got to go see it you got to have it right next to your fucking eyes for you to understand why this streak right is as wonderful as i say it is um and that's like mm -hmm. in all cases right it's like let's get you know the person as far away as we can from any possibility of engaging with this thing so they don't have to comment on it so they don't have to make me feel bad because it's very likely that you won't be able to see a certain painting you know uh, uh in real life you know anytime in your life right so let's let's yeah. you know let's sort of you know circumvent your criticism by by invoking this thing that we know that you're not going to have an opportunity to do Right. So it's a similar kind of thing. Right. It's the same kind of, you know, Steppenwolf set of tactics that we get again and again. Um, yeah. Well, it's a couple of thoughts uh, as pertains to what you were just talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to just to strike a balance and do some of both, because I texted you like a couple months ago, whenever that was, when I was at a live symphony show, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in San Francisco. And it was great. I mean, I, I really, it had been yeah. years since I had been to a live classical performance, especially, you know, I've been to indie shows, rock shows, whatever. Um, so that it really was nice. And it was good to be, to be there and, you know, feel the vibrating in the auditorium and everything that's going on. But generally, of course, first of all, just monetarily, it's like, well, you can't afford to go see all this stuff live and it only mm -hmm. comes around every once in a while. Um, I, I also recently went to a gallery show, um, for Alex Soth, a photographer I mentioned in our first uh, photography episode. And I will say, 
you know, like I, I had built an appreciation of his work just through his website. It's well laid out. It's got, you know, big swaths of all of his projects there. Um, but to go see it up on the wall was definitely a treat. I mean, the massive prints, you know, uh, taking up four or five feet by four or five feet, uh, sometimes even larger. And, you know, definitely there is something to be said for that, but, um, but it's a nice, it, it's an, it's a cherry on top, I guess, you know, it's a nice yeah, yeah, bonus. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, but in, in the main, you know, we have to, and should get to consume these things through whatever, uh, you know, more egalitarian, uh, ways it comes around to us. I think the other interesting part, cause I, you know, I highlighted that same section that you just read, um, of Mozart talking to Harry, another good device, I think on Hess's part, because a, there's humor in it, right? Like instead of Mozart being this like self-serious, I was a prodigy and I died young and I, you know, have so much insight and all this stuff. He basically just ends up scolding Harry and talking down to him and being like, you know, a, a, a disappointed, uh, you know, tutor or something. And uh, seems to kind of have a good sense of humor himself about all this stuff. And um, it just kind of goes to show that, you know, this person who seems to be Harry's ultimate hero, I mean, he, he talks about Goethe, he talks about Handel, he talks about some others, um, but Mozart's the one that, you know, kind of comes up time and again, where he's gotten like nothing but praise reserved for him. Um, that these figures, you know, appear to him. And instead of it being like a, a good positive typical experience, they end up chiding him in mm -hmm. some way, you know, uh, and, and seem to almost say, you've gotten me wrong you know, all this time that you've spent with me uh, and with my work and the, the image that you've built and the understanding that you think you've gained may not be what you think it is. Uh, and here it is straight from my own mouth in a way. I mean, it's obviously Hesse speaking as these people, as the author who knows what they really would have said, but um, it is a, you know, a, a, nice, a nice device, I think. Yeah. And I mean, just uh, to like quickly uh, touch on the ending, um, mm -hmm. just just a capstone to this idea of like, you know, the, the humor uh, and, you know, perhaps like what is a, a way to approach life? And I mean, I've sort of, you know, uh, said the same thing before, and I think a lot, a lot of people have. Um, so after he gets chided by Pablo for uh, um, killing this, I guess you could call it Im the image of Hermine, um, uh, the step one wolf says, I understood it all. I understood Pablo. I understood Mozart. And somewhere behind me, I heard his ghastly laughter. I knew that all the hundred thousand pieces of life's game were in my pocket. A glimpse of its meaning had stirred my reason, and I was determined to begin the game afresh. I would sample its tortures once more and shudder again at its senselessness. I would traverse not once more, but often the hell of my inner being. One day I would be a better hand at the game. One day I would learn how to laugh. Pablo was waiting for me and Mozart too. Um, so I mean, a, a, a couple of things, right? This idea of like taking a life uh, essentially as a game, right? Um, mm -hmm. a, a game that, you know, it's not that you don't take it seriously. It's that you understand that there's so many rules that are arbitrary. There's so many things that you could break. There aren't uh, necessarily all these players that would suddenly, you know, rush out and be like, you, you, you're fucking up the game. Like, that's not how it's played. That's not how it's played. Some might do that, right? Anytime that you, you know, push against convention, anytime that you push against rules, of course, there are people that are upset. But, you know, it depends, I guess, on what rules you break, what conventions you wish to defy. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you do have to sort of treat things seriously, but not so seriously that... Uh, everything is so kind of like rigid and you can't break free. You know, so you, you have to be able, you have to be able to break free. And, you know, this idea of like, it's a perpetual process, right? He doesn't, you know, he comes to certain realizations, but those realizations themselves, they do imply an endless process, right? There's always this you know, sense of like, uh, 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 you know, being turning into becoming, becoming back into being, and this kind of like perpetual flux, certain things might, yeah. you know, become, you know, permanent within you. And, you know, that is a, that is a good thing, right. In terms of like having these anchors, but even the anchors themselves, like you might sort of move them around a little bit, right. You always need to be willing to uh, revise various parts of your life, various parts of your um, existence. And, 
you know, uh, to the extent that even in the introduction, there's like a lot of avenues for perhaps having a more pessimistic view of what ultimately happens to Harry. Um, you know, this idea of like being in flux and yet not necessarily backpedaling, uh, that could also be part of it. I mean, Harry could still be, it's true, walking around, you know, sniffing at uh, the rose bushes and, you know, trying to, um, uh, you know, be closer and closer to the bourgeois life that he sort of really uh, uh, enjoys, even if he doesn't altogether respect it. But still, you know, that could be part of that flux, right? That could be, you know, you don't have to necessarily give up, you know, all those things about you that are vices, right? Um, you mm -hmm. could, you could discipline these vices, right? You could, you know, whip them into shape, you could give them some kind of utility, you could use them in sort of like, you know, controlled manners to, um, you know, maybe there's going to be like, you know, another book out of it for for Harry, right? As long as he doesn't completely drench, drench, drench himself in the stuff, because, you know, he's, he, he, he gave the book that he needed to give about those topics. The question is, are there mm -hmm. other topics in this flux left? And, the idea, I think, ideally, is that there ought to be, right? There ought to always be something called next, next, next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I guess my last thought is that with the ending of the the book, the book of Steppenwolf, but also which signifies the ending of Harry Holler's records, right, and the manuscript that he wrote, um, that does it ties back to the preface and maybe this is part of why the nephew said i believe he's still out there right he's still he's still walking up steps because he himself says i have the pieces in my pocket now i have a better understanding i've interacted with the world other people my heroes uh some villains you know on and on and i'm determined to play the game better um so if you take him at his word then then yeah you know he would theoretically still be uh, out and about and not trying to just have an accident with the razor um mm -hmm. so yeah you know great novel three and a half out of five stars probably mm. um <laughs> maybe three and a half out of four three and a half out of four three and a half out of four wow okay yeah. um yeah that's the other part three and a half stars but we're never out of what out yeah of how many he just said out of how many yeah. was it you know 10 four five uh 3.7 uh we don't know now but it's yeah it's a very enjoyable read um definitely would would recommend um people to read it and it, it's it's a very it's nice to do the back-to-back -back with siddhartha you know mm -hmm. especially like i mean siddhartha is so quick um it just it gives you a lot to to linger on between you know the two novels together yeah, obviously I, has, has has other novels i haven't read his other stuff yet though like i said i've got that collection of short stories i picked up but I haven't read Demion or uh, some of his others. So I should at some point. Yeah, I'd say of the two, uh, Siddhartha is probably my preferred novel. I'm not sure if it's necessarily better, but I would say that although I could point to some flaws here and there in Steppenwolf, despite it still being a great novel, I'm not sure if I could do that with um, Siddhartha. It seems it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty close uh, to, to perfect, right? Probably because it's just so short. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity to sort of like, it's, it's very hard to like, okay, let me do a thousand page book and make it perfect. Right. Um, yeah. and you know, perfection is not, perfection is not necessarily, uh, the worthiest goal in and of itself, right? A lot of people confuse that, but, uh, at the same time, you know, there is something to say for, you know, I wrote a great novel that all, also happens to be like a perfect or a near perfect novel um like uh, like siddhartha but i don't know maybe maybe it's something that we could yeah. discuss in more depth uh, at some point later it's easy enough of a read we'll probably get through it um in less than three hours yeah yeah, yeah. i mean there's there's plenty to talk about but uh yeah it's, it's it breezes by it's you almost have to uh check yourself up while you're reading it so that you don't miss things because it it just kind yeah. of keeps on flowing yeah by yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, in that's a good that's way another difference yeah that's another difference that i was uh, thinking uh like for example uh, one of my favorite yeah. lines from siddhartha is uh when you know like everything positive about siddhartha is presented in the first uh page and a half or so but then you get this kind of like dark turn where the paragraph opens with like siddhartha has started uh to nurture dissatisfaction within himself Right. And that's such mm -hmm. a, it's such a short, but wonderful line. Like think about what that means. Like, what does it mean to nurture dissatisfaction within yourself? 
right? Is it like, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy that it becomes? Like, do you, you know, sort of like uh, emphasize some negative qualities in yourself that you want to correct for? What does that mean exactly, right? But it's so, you know, evocative and compelling. And it's just like a little line that you could easily miss, right? Um, you, it's simply because you would miss that one little word that that does so much in that sentence. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like the text is just full of senses like that. So anyway, um, but maybe we should we should uh, uh, close out uh, here. Uh, so you and I will be back uh, next month with um, uh, Gravity's Rainbow and uh, Slaughterhouse Five. We're gonna take them together in one show. Hopefully, that does not have to run to like five six hours. But you know who knows? You know uh, we've never done two books at once. It's bad. We 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 can't control ourselves with one book. Okay, let's see if we could control yeah. our, 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 ourselves with two. But maybe like the presence of a second book is going to have like a you know, a disciplining factor. Right. Um, so uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it goes, but anyway, guys, thank you yeah. for watching. This has been artifact number 26. Again, you could subscribe on YouTube. You could hit like, but you could also subscribe to the audio podcast feed. This is on Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever you want. You are most likely covered except some of the hipster stuff. I don't touch some of the, um, uh, hipster distributions, but, um, you know, just check it out. See, see if it's available on your preferred app. Again, thank you for watching. Hit like, hit, hit subscribe. It really does help in lieu of anything else. You could also comment, right? A lot of people get it twisted. They think that when I comment back, I'm helping, you know, I'm helping them. I'm helping myself. I'm juicing the algo. So if you're really upset by this video, <laughs> And you can't fucking help yourself when you start commenting. Guess what? You're you're doing a disservice to yourself because you're amplifying my values. You're amplifying Joel's values, and we are here <laughs> laughing at you with Mozart's laughter, right? While you wear the mask of "I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm doing it, I'm doing this so that so that you could be angry." No, 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 I'm not angry. I'm happy. See, 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 I'm happy. See, see. <laughs> <laughs> um all right so Goodness. uh all right well, let's just end it here goodbye good Bye. oh my god oh my god